everybody, to another edition of Tackle Shop Live. Appreciate everybody uh, stopping in. As always, I'm here with uh, my partner, George, the big man in the house. And we got Corbin down on the end, who's becoming a regular fixture around here. I hope everybody's been checking out. And today, special guest, and we're going to get in-depth with him. Really happy to have him here. The man behind Smallmouth Crush, Travis Manson. Yeah. Travis, how you doing, bro? Hey, I'm, I'm wonderful. Yeah. I can't complain. You can't complain. So, I mean, it's Not great complain. to have you here. We've been trying to get you to get you to the shop for years, man. But you, for, for all of our events, it's always been something going on with you, some show somewhere, traveling around the place, you know. So, it's really nice to have you here today. We appreciate that, pal. Awesome. All right. So, let's move on. Now, we're going get, to get things going here. <laughs> And we are going to segue into our man, Travis Manson. Just like that. Just like that, bro. Mm. And it's takeover. <laughs> well, where do we even start? There's so much to talk about. I see a bunch of awesome baits here, a lot of baits that I use on a regular basis that we're going to have to dig in. Well, we got, we got history with you. Yeah. We've known you since you moved to the area back in 20... I don't even remember. Early, man. It was like... Let's go with 2013. I was going to say... No. Um, that was early. No. That was before that. Yeah. No. 2010, you were living in your truck down by the river. That's true. <laughs> down at that campsite on the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, I so, remember that. So, we, I mean, we knew you from the very beginning. And, you know, from the very beginning, you getting to us. Not not to, of your fishing career, because you, you got a whole other thing up north, That's just, which is huge. Up north and out west. Yeah, well, is that Northwest? No, it's the middle little part. Both? It's the bread basket. The bread basket. Well, whatever. Bread basket. You've got some fishing up. He's in at Gre- the top of the bread basket. He's, Isn't that in Nebraska? Well, yeah, but you're you're like straight up. Oh, okay. I was going to say Green Green Bay areas. Yeah, you fished originally at, you fished Wisconsin. At Green Bay. Yeah, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, is that where the name Smallmouth Crush came from? No. Uh, so Smallmouth Crush was really uh, started only about four years ago. As a name, a catchy name for what I wanted to do, you know, make start making, creating videos on YouTube. And I had a variety of different names I was looking at, but I needed one that would work and was available on all social media. So Instagram, YouTube, and it had to be somewhat, I think it's pretty catchy. But I had awesome. a, 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 very, a, a lot of different names and really... It's developed around my passion for smallmouth fishing and smallmouth bass, of course, although we do break it down and talk anything and everything fishing-related when it comes to bass fishing. But I like to – I get more excited dealing with smallmouth over any other species out there. So that's why – Don't we all? We're smallmouth crush. Absolutely. Beautiful. Now, yeah. I always thought the smallmouth crush was kind of like what you just described, but it went back to your roots of – Crushing giant brown backs up there in Green Bay. Yeah. I, so so that you, you were kind of like the smallmouth crusher. Mm. So I thought it was more of a play on words. Do I have a crush on a smallmouth bass? Uh, yeah. Or do I crush okay. big bass? I, I didn't uh, think of it from that, I mean, from that angle. I, mean, I, just, I just knew from talking, talking with you over the years – I don't and, think it's weird, dude, that you have a crush on your, You okay, would tell good. me about your Wisconsin trips, and I'm you'd with you be up that. there just jacking them. Yeah, there's some big fish. There's big fish all over the country, really. Um, but that region of the country and the Great Lakes, of course, that's where the studs live. I would love to go up yeah, and fish at. It, it, they do. And, and it's like you have, like, different subspecies of them because, you know, if you go out here on the Susquehanna River and catch – a lot of fish, you're going to get very, very few five-pounders, very, very few. Po- but every three-and-a-half to four that you catch that's pushing four is going to look like a gigantic fish. Right. They're different shape, body shape overall. You go up to where you spend three months a year at least, um, the, the, up on the river and Lake Ontario, those fish – for us, when we go up, Mike and I go up infrequently, you know, once or twice a year. Mm-hmm. When we go up and catch a 
giant fish. We 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 underestimate them by like a pound because they're totally different. And then you like weigh them or what the right. Something wrong with the scale. Yeah. <laughs> They're bigger than you think. They They're are. Giants. They, exactly. Those fish are much bigger than you think. So how about how are the fish in Green Bay area now, those smallies, are they different shape and size? No, most of the uh, Great Lakes fish are very similar in size. The only difference is the body of water, whether it be Erie, Ontario, Sturgeon Bay, you know, Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, is the way they fight. So some bodies of water... You know, and depending on how deep of water. So Ontario, for instance, a lot of times when you're fishing deep, that fish is going to come straight out of the water instantly. So that first three seconds, that fish is coming up. And you actually have an opportunity, if you're quick, with the net to scoop them in. But you need a special net, don't you, do. you Travis? You do. You is, need a guy that, that knows what? how to work in that. I believe Corbin wants to ask you about your special we, net. We can get into that. But my point is these fish will come up, and then they'll go back down, and then you got to fight them for, you know, six, seven, eight minutes. Where other parts of the Great Lakes, uh, you know, Lake Michigan, back in Wisconsin, those fish, they, they just have a little w- different way of, of, of fighting when you do catch one. That's curious that you say that because I noticed uh, fishing in the Buffalo region on Lake Erie uh, when the fish are deeper, say 30, 35 feet, and you're, you're traditionally drop shotting them on 2D sonar. And <laughs> when you set the hook, you're going to be eyeball level with that fish in a three count, and then your drag is going to be sizzling yes. in a three count, which... You know, we talk about the drags on spinning reels. Um, and a lot of our fishing around here, I mean, a good drag is important, but it's it's a lot of our fish don't pull too much drag. Those fish up there? All of them do. Will be testing your drag. Mm-hmm. And if it's not correct, working properly, that little splinter of a hook, he gone. Absolutely. So that's interesting, um, and 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 that was something I, that I had kind of had in the back of my mind. I wanted to ask you about. So. Well, George, we got a lot of guys uh, checking in here and saying and hi, we got Mike. saying hi to Travis. You know, we got Mark from uh, Lisa Lake Fishing Club, uh, John Cops stopping in, uh, Kyle stopping in, Wrigley. He's saying uh, drop shot and with the white claws. Hmm. You, you probably know that name. Only in the summer. Yeah, <laughs> only the summer. Red wine. We've in the got. Uh, um, uh, Michael stopping in. We got uh, Junior Del Clamp sa- stopping in. Uh, Del Camp, I'm sorry. And uh, we got Oliver Nye. You know Oliver, don't yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. Oliver stopping in, saying hi to you guys. And uh, he's What's always up, been Oliver? he's always been a good good fan of ours and a great guy. And we loved having him stopping in. We uh, need to get we need to get Oliver on sometime. Kevin Carpenter, who watches every show. How you doing, Kevin? Russell White. John Sullivan, Harry Nurk, how are you, Harry? Mike, yeah, I mean, these guys are all stopping to see Travis, so thank you so much. Eric, how you doing? Uh, Richie Hall, as always, stopping in. Terry Wells, Terry Wells is a big fan of yours. He's a friend of our shop. He helps us with everything. He, cool, cool. He, he well, hello, Terry. Yeah. Well, Mike, yeah. here's the deal. Uh, the reason you get such a cross-section with Travis, you know, in addition to Smallmouth Crush, which is just, wow, Tons of videos yeah. and live, yeah, quite a bit of live work on the water. But I mean, you can go back and view just a volume of work. Good stuff. You also have Travis's guide service, and which is pretty diversified. Because uh, I took a couple notes here to make sure I didn't screw up. I know you're big on the Chesapeake Bay. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we get you know that we've established that since 2011 when you were trying to make the elites, which you did. Um, yeah, but, which was a good story there. Yeah, well, I have an interesting story from that, which we'll get into. We'll delve into deeper. So do I. But <laughs> there's also two or three months out of the year that you spend up north right. riding. Yes. So On the river mm-hmm. and Lake Ontario. Lake Ontario. And then the Conowinga Pool. I'm impressed about the time. You, you'll time. get. You'll take. Yeah. A, you'll take a trip if someone requests. If they want to head out there, sir. To the absolutely. Reservoir. They're a absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so you know, you have a pretty well well versed, and I think a lot of people who are chiming in here 
are fans of one of each of those. Sure. But, you know, so like you'll have your Bay guys that follow you. You'll have your up north guys that follow you, and you have your like reservoir like Conowinga Pond type guys that know you fish there. They'll mm-hmm. follow you. Um, for for information on those fisheries, as well as the other information that comes along, like drop shot talking and auctions know, and auctions and, and yeah. the auctions. Yes. Yep. That was pretty exciting. We yep. watched a little of that. It was a late night, but <laughs> yeah. good thing we only do those a couple times a year. Yeah. You either love them or you hate them. And well, they are very entertaining. They are entertaining. <laughs> um, that, what impresses me is with that whole array is how you took the time to learn the Thousand Islands and, and Ontario. Yeah, so, man, well, I'll kind of back it up a little bit. My main, you know, I only live about 50 minutes from the Chesapeake. Right. And so... Pretty much March, April, May, and June, that's, that's where that's I'll where be you're at, yeah. every day out yeah. there guiding and fishing tournaments on the weekends. Uh, after that, you know, it, it's... You've done very well down there in tournaments. Yeah, I, I enjoy it there. Yeah. 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 Uh, a- after, you know, after Ju- July rolls around, let's be honest, the Chesapeake yeah. isn't always the, the funnest... Uh, it's you not. Know, the place <laughs> to be. Uh, she can be a little stingy. It can. You know, five, six bites a day is what you're fishing for. And I tell my, my clients, hey, if you want to go out that time of year, here's what you can expect, and we'll go do it. But uh, I think there's a lot better opportunities later in the year, and that's why I kind of gravitate more towards heading up north mm-hmm. and uh, chasing those big smallmouth mm-hmm. around. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, so um, with the... With, uh, with the Thousand Islands and Lake Ontario and the Chesapeake Bay, when did you develop your drop shot? And hmm. I mean, you know, it's it's been like it's like everybody that knows you is like, well, yeah, he's a hellacious drop shotting guy. He's 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 done. He's been there and done that. And that's kind of like why we why we decided to talk on this because mm-hmm. you have some pretty interesting uh, ideas with it. But uh, every time we talk to you, or read or see you, you're you're always talking about the drop shots. So where where did you kind of come up? Well, up with that, it was it did something was just you e- eased into. Or? Well, well, growing up in Wisconsin, I originally got started in fishing primarily for walleyes, and yes, so we trolled, maybe casted some crankbaits to them, but a lot of uh, enjoyment I had fishing for walleyes revolved around a spinning rod and pitching jigs, uh, oh. whether it be leeches, night crawlers, plastics like that, yeah. over rocks and grass things like that, and so that's where my I guess my comfort level with a spinning rod came into play. And I just kind of carried that forward. You know, I do love drop shine. I really, I just love working a bait with a spinning rod as much as I can. I just feel like that's my yeah. comfort level. Like it's, it's what I have confidence in. You know, a lot of these bigger events, when I do get the opportunity to qualify for a bigger championship tournament yeah. that might be down south or a different part of the country, I'm normally incorporating that you got, spinning rod. You have it in your hand all the time. In places you probably should yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you do. And, and, and that's what's great about following you because you see that. You mm-hmm. see that in your hand all the time. 80% of the time, I would say. Yeah. Like Guido Hidden used to say, you have to hook them to lose them. Right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> if you're not getting the bite. Good point. And yeah. you're not hooking the fish, you can't lose them. Yeah. So with that spinning rod, at least it gives you a opportunity. So, yeah. so then when did, the, when did the drop, did you learn drop shot through somebody telling you or did you like read about it or? You know, I, I, I wish it? I could remember. Yeah. Uh, I do remember the first drop shot rod. It was, uh, I don't even know if they're around there. It's a, it was a Tika. Did you ever hear of that? Oh, oh yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was yeah, yeah. a Tika drop shot rod. It was, it was probably. Was actually named drop shot rod? Yeah, well, maybe not, but I, yeah. it was the right bend yeah, and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I started with that. I actually yeah. used that rod uh, during the Elite Series. So. That's a whole other story. Yeah. I, you know, growing up in Wisconsin, I only fished for bass since 07 and made the elites in 2010. So I only had three years of bass fishing under my belt. Now I'm going up against Mike Iaconelli's and KVD's and Skeet Reese's yeah. with very little experience. And yeah. looking back now, I knew nothing didn't belong there at all. Somehow, wow. magically, I made it there. But I think what you- th- there was so much more to learn about the, the sport of bass fishing and the different techniques. And yeah. I was not yeah. ready at that time. Well, you know, the thing about that is, and me and George talk about that all the time with guys, you know, you, you get that opportunity, and if you don't take it, then the what if is, you know, mm, always. Sure. You can't do that. You've right. got to do it. Right. And, and that's why you had to do that. Mm-hmm. 
and there was no way for you not to not to do it at that even at that time. Sure. Even and, and you learned a lot out of it. Yeah, absolutely. You learned you learned what it takes to be one. Uh, you know, also, what, I don't what it think, takes to do that. I don't mm-hmm. think you can compare um like let's just say for for the sake of years, let's just say two thousand to two thousand ten, what you knew then versus what you could have known then to be ready versus now the access to knowledge and information mm-hmm. via smallmouth crush, via Tack a Shop Live, via a guide trip with Corbin, via the internet, via uh, Bassmaster magazine. Uh, There's no excuses nowadays. Now, no, you're right. You know, you're exactly right. I'm um, not making excuses for the past either, but the availability was different. The amount of information was different. So, you know, you say you weren't ready to fish the elites in 2010, but you're saying that from the perspective of 2020. In 2010, uh, which is when I first got to know you fishing and preparing for that tournament that got you there, mm-hmm. you were ready, you know, and, you sure. know, you, that makes but sense. you just didn't realize that you didn't know what you didn't know mm-hmm. because that knowledge highway wasn't there. You follow what I'm trying to get at? Absolutely. That makes sense. You know, um, Mm -hmm. because I have, I feel the same way, you know, back when I did a lot of tournament fishing and was able to qualify for some, some bigger trails and bigger events, you know, I sort of felt ready then, but, but looking back on it, I was like, you know, we're leading, you know, fur seals to the slaughter. Mm. You know, sure, but I didn't feel that way back <laughs> then. No, you're, you know, you guys are all, seals all you guys are. I hate, cocky to, as I hate to say that if there's any tree huggers hell. out there, we may have a Ike and Ellie who Kevin Van Dam, what you know, you guys are ready to kill them guys, you know. Well, uh, you George, know, I mean, hey, you know, I got uh, hey, flames coming out of my I've motor. got a guy that says, uh, uh, Mr. Cox says he started fishing in 1998 with the drop shot rig. So that's a long time ago. That is a long time ago. And Leland Hansford, George, wants you to say, he wants me to tell you, go Buckeyes. That might be a sore subject from last <laughs> night. Yeah, Leland, kinda, Leland so, I made a rather large investment in that that's game. Leland. So this isn't a good time to talk about uh, that. What do we got? We got um, uh, another guy saying, uh, hey, uh, where's the wed wine for Travis? Which we already talked about. Randy Egger. Randy Egger. He's saying hi. He's for, one, the, he, for the second time yeah. today. He was here earlier. Yeah. Hi, Randy. Uh, Hot pocket. Uh, Brian, how you doing? Brian Ray Concepcion. Really? That's a great name, man. It is. See you, Good Mike Pools. Ain't that a cool name? Thanks for stopping by. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Pools leaving the building. See you, Mike Pools. He's going to go study the <laughs> maps. Uh, Ryan Bauman. Jos- Ryan Bauman's in the house with Joseph A. Zombeck. Mr. Zombeck. You know them guys. Yeah. You know Ryan, too. He's a hammer. Uh, yeah, yeah. He got mad at me for fishing some grass last uh, last spring. So. Pretty sure he's over it now. Nah, I don't think so. Really? No. Oh, no. come on, Ryan. <laughs> Get over it. Man, don't be such a one of them guys. All right, so, anyway. um, So, George, tell us, to, you know, we're, we're, we're going to bounce around. This mm. is what we do. We bounce around. Absolutely. All over the place. I love it. So, we, you know, and just having you here... Unscripted. It's, it's cool shit, you know. It's really, for us, it's really cool shit to have you here. How long does this go for? Because there's so much. Hours. Okay, good. Hours, bro. Okay, How long good. do you want it to go There's no for? limitations. There's no we limit We will not here. be here at midnight. We are going to go. Oh, really? Listen, we're going to delve into the drop shot. Okay. Into levels that I don't even think you've ever been there. We're going deep. Mm. I want to get focused up on this drop shot thing yeah. pretty quick. But, uh. But I do want to recollect the story. Yeah, we got okay. we got a couple stories. We got a story or two yeah. we got we got to bring up about <laughs> Travis. Well, I mean, this was a good story because we have, it's great. It's great mm. stories. You know, when 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 uh, us here at Susquehanna first met Travis, he was rolling up into town. He was getting ready for the Bass Open on the Upper Chesapeake Bay in 2010, and he was on a roll. Um, and he was trying to qualify for the elites. And you know, coincidentally, I was also fishing that tournament. So you know, me and Travis were you know, running to each other here and there, and talk a little bit here at the shop, the old shop. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, whatever, we get around, it's tournament time. And uh, Travis and I are having a pretty good event, and we 
qualify and make it through to day three. Were they three or four days back then? Three. Yeah, so we get we make it through to the cut the cut to the final day. And you know, the fishing was not great, but but we had a little something, you know, he, he was doing his thing, I was doing my thing. They were kind of similar, so we sort of, inter, our paths crossed. And Travis may not even know where I'm going here. This is not going to be a grass bed story. Right? <laughs> nope. So I I'm, know exactly where you're going, by the I, way. I'm working a, I'm working a, a little marina and uh, getting bit, you know, every now and again. And Travis is coming up towards me, and he's like, man, he goes, I, I, I I, man, I need one more good bite. One more good bite. And uh, was it was it like that, or was it more of a plead? No, 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 no. No, it was it was because he was excited. Was, I know, right? It was momentum. It was it was. I, man, I just need. I know if I get one more good bite, I'm in. And I'm like, dude. And I just kicked my trolling motor, and just kicked out. And I'm like, and I'm a son of a gun. This honest <laughs> to God, like <laughs> I was in mid pitch and I just kicked the bow out and he just put that bait up in there and just as pretty as you would see, man, he hits a good one. And he gets this fish in the boat. And uh, <laughs> the it was like the, the the goal was achieved. Now when I kicked my bow out, I, that kind of put me over towards this fuel dock. Over a ways, I was kind of idle, uh, drifting towards them, and I'm watching. I mean, I got a front row seat, and this guy in the fuel dock became concerned for Travis. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and like, I mean, it was awesome, man. It was like, it was, it was. You work so hard to get to that point, and I think it was something like. I'm in the fucking elites. <laughs> I don't know. If it, yeah, like I, th- I knew that hey, was man. a key fish. I don't um, know, Travis. I fished with you in that tournament as a rider and netted some of those fish with that long net. And okay, walk me through. Stick. What day was that? I don't know if I was with you two or three. Me? But, no, but, that was the last day. That was the last day. But, but, but when I was with Well, you, you would have known then if it was day three. You, you were, like, ecstatic because you left a place south, and I'm not going to say where it was, with two fish. Ran okay. into the northeast and you flipped up a couple on some docks and you caught that yeah. last one, man. And you were like, "How? Why? Uh, yeah, that's impossible." Looking back, yeah. But it was knowing like, what it I know now awesome. on the Chesapeake, how does someone that doesn't even, you know, it's September maybe that tournament was. It was yeah. a rough, it, it was, was rough tough. time of the year, man. I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know any of the key areas at all, and I caught three fish. It was yeah, I randomly. Mean, yeah, well, I think in, in the Northeast in the last like hour and well, a half of the yeah, day. Yeah, and I mm-hmm. think what happened was the same thing that, that happened to me in that tournament. You know, what we were doing on that final day, we were not doing on the first Correct. day. Right, right. Yeah. Because the fishing was that year, that particular year, the bay was extreme. There was a very little rainfall. The Susquehanna was in a drought stage. The bay was extremely salty. Mm. There was crabs. In the Susquehanna, there was three foot long needlefish in the Susquehanna, and things were changing rapidly. And I know, I know what I was doing in my practice was completely different than what I was doing in the tournament. And I, I know from talking to you back then, I remember you saying the same thing. And I mean, where you ended up, you know, with Corbin, and when you, where you ended up with me. Where we were, that was not what we were planning on doing on day one. No, and I honestly don't think I've ever caught another fish out of that marina since. <laughs> I may have caught one or two, but but not like that. But it, it, I'll tell you what, and I don't remember Travis if I was with you day two or day three, but I know it was one of those important days. But when you set the hook, and I'm there trying to like use this forty foot net to land this fish in three foot of water. Yeah, man. so tell and us we about got the net. And we want to break that net down for a we second. We should. Well. Because I don't think Corbin understands why that net is designed like that. And, well, here's another a reason why, wish I knew now, you know, back then, the coming from Wisconsin and big water and partner team tournaments where you can trust the person that's netting your fish. You know, it's not a random, no offense to anybody's a stranger in the boat for that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I thought, well, it's going to help me. In situation, so a very long net. The net was probably, you know, it extended out. It was a ten foot net, but could extend to twenty. Okay, <laughs> ten foot net. <laughs> Hold on. So, so and, and this is why. I mean, we're going, 
and we're making this run, and it's pretty choppy, and Travis is hammered down his Triton at the time. And was, was it Triton? Or yep, Triton. Triton. Yep. And, I mean, he's hammered down, seven-foot flipping stick, and then there's this net, and I'm thinking, this thing's going to come and knock me out, but I'm just <laughs> holding on, man. I'm holding on. Well, Corbin, I think you were like 12 back then, too. Oh, good one, Mikey. <laughs> good one. So the net's literally, Hold on, can you we know, get some sound effects on that. It's a big net, right? It, not only the, oh, is yeah. the handle long, but the net's <laughs> wide. Yep. And here's why. So when you're fishing big waves, so I still use a net like this when I'm fishing a team tournament on Absolutely. the Great Lakes. Absolutely. Because you get that fish that comes out by those coats of sunglasses right there and surfaces with a little net like this, you're not going to scoop them. You mean a Joe Raymond net? Yeah, I don't even know what, what that deal's all about. <laughs> the, the trout net, the Joe. I don't carries. get that. <laughs> I don't either. But any of these nets here would not work for me. Sorry, Joe. Yeah. On the Great Lakes. Yeah, the deal yeah. with the Great Lakes is 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 you're here on the top of this wave. Sure. Your line is literally through the air, where it comes out of this wave and goes back underwater in that wave. But it gets tricky because you have to know exactly when to get at that fish. You have yeah. to trust your partner. There yeah. has to be communication. Yeah. That fish is on the top of you that. You got to kind of know what's going on there. Yes, yeah. they have to be good with the yeah, net. With now, the net. another thing that maybe people don't realize is that net is actually unbelievable. If I had a major tournament and uh, a partner that I could could trust with the net, even on the Chesapeake Bay, let's say in the grass in the slop. When you the, when you get a frogfish on, oh, yeah. and he's buried it. up in that stuff, oh yeah, you can take that net and grab it. Now listen, so you know Jack Jack Rinkers, oh, yeah. we, yeah, we yeah, fished yeah. A, a championship tournament on the Potomac, and he buried one up in the grass that was six oh, yeah. six feet down and would not move. Like basically, you either keep pulling, the line's gonna break. I took that net and just stuck it down there and scraped and just hoped, and it came up with the fish. <laughs> Well, that's what I was going to say. That's awesome. How many fish did that thing save you? A lot. O over the yeah. years. A yeah. lot. And, yeah. and I don't feel comfortable without that, especially in a team of yeah. Yeah. up north. Yeah. I mean, we literally have in our notes yeah. the net. The, the net. net. Yeah. Yeah. Chris so. Bowes gave me a lot of crap about mm. that uh, in the opens <laughs> that year. You know, it was funny. Well, but, and he's originally from the north, so he should have well, anybody should have understood It was an that. extreme, you know. It was an extreme it was, net. It was pretty extreme. It was yeah. an extreme but, net. But. But Travis, I did not lose any of your fish in the net. Right, that's good. I mean, I'm just, yep. that's good. just saying. Yep. Travis's net was originally designed for netting salmon, salmon off of a trolling boat on the because you know they have a pretty high side yeah. on them because mm -hmm. it gets ugly out there. So you know you need four or five foot of handle just to get to the water, and then you want to be able to get that net out there. Yep. And you put it behind the salmon, and you just kind of let the salmon back into the net. Mm -hmm. I thought it was used for lifting uh, flounder up over a head boat. It could, it could, that would work. It's got a lot of uses, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yep. A couple of things, George. Before we move on here, I'm going to get, I'm going to delve into this drop shot. Drop shot now. But are oh, uh, you going to delve into it now? We're going to delve into it right now. We're just getting started. Oh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But, but, but I got a couple of things first. Yeah. All right. So one of the things is is um, you know Kenny Jester is stopping in here and he's saying. Uh, Tell George that Joe Keita had drop shotted back in the eighties. I knew it with a six foot uh, Loomis IM six and a <laughs> and an SS thirteen hundred Daiwa. Yeah. I knew it. Yeah, I knew uh, it. So Kenny Howard, uh, Keith Howard, stopping in. Carl Walker, how are you Keith. doing, Carl? You were here today. And uh, how you doing, Keith Howard? Keith, I hope your boat's done soon. I know they're looking on your track. Ryan's Ryan's telling me that. Uh, there was a 96-year-old man with Travis on day three. He was scared to death when Travis was screaming. I I definitely, uh, I think I maybe, I don't want to say tackled when I caught that fish, but I <laughs> hugged him. Yeah, that's good. Like a big hug. Nothing wrong with that. Was that a, was that a report from our on-the-water roving reporter, Mike? <laughs> yeah. Ryan uh, Bowman. Uh, Renee Thank Lynn you. is stopping in. I know. I was over at the gas dock, and I was just trying to comfort the Mark gas Burgess. Attendant. Mark Burgess. You remember Mark Burgess, Mark George? Burgess. Absolutely. Mark, yeah. how are you? Mark. Uh, you know Mark Cody Mark Edmonds. And Andre. Andre. Uh, bro, thank you so much. Mm. What is look, that? Look at that. Nice. Huh? Did you ever have anything like that? No, I... Are you a rum drinker? No, no. I mean, no. Not well, too much. We're not really like... <laughs> Me neither. A, we're not either, but I'm telling you, I, looks, I've had it. Mm -hmm. This is good stuff. This is from uh, St. Croix. Mm. I don't know, St. Croix. that really make the rods? Andre, we, we are going to mix some drinks up after the night. We're going to have some rum and Cokes, because that's all we know how to make. With our St. Croix. We're going to have some rum and Cokes tonight with the St. Croix. Thank you. Hold a St. Croix rod. So thank you so much. 
Uh, but right now, um, we want to delve into, George just taught me that word last week, delve. Delve. The world of drop shot. Delve into, into the world of drop shot Ooh, yeah. with smallmouth crush Travis Manson. Okay. Let's segue into this. You don't have right that on your show, do you? No. No. This is all for Travis. Travis, Travis doesn't have that soundboard. Mm-mm. Let's get deep, deep, deep into the art. Of drop shotting. So do you want me to just oh, we want start to s- or you want to ask questions? We're going to yes. do both. We're okay. going to do both. Just okay. start into it. We're going to go all the way from rods and reels all the way through to baits and hooks and okay. everything. So let's just let's just go. Let's, let's start. Just go. Okay, let's start with applications for drop shotting. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Perfect. It's not just for smallmouth. I use it for largemouth and smallmouth. It doesn't matter if I'm in two feet of water or 60 feet of water. I'll utilize a drop shot throughout the year, and regardless of smallmouth or largemouth bass. Yeah. So it's for me, it's um, it's always on my deck. I can't think of a an event or a situation where it probably wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, ready to go at all times. And and shallow and deep water. Absolutely. Because a lot of guys just think it's a deep water technique. Sure. Yeah. They do. Um. But. To get to that point, you have to have, you have to use it. You have to start fishing it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, any place you want to throw a finesse plastic or even a, a medium sized plastic, you know, let's say you're fishing an area where you're fishing laydowns with yeah. a Texas rig creature bait or a yeah. power worm or something. Right. Not where you're like pitching into heavy cover, but you're just kind of fishing that. That's a place where you could certainly throw a drop shot as well and give those fish a little bit different look. But I really think it allows you to, for me, it's more about being one with the bait and understanding what that bait's doing under the water. And that drop shot allows me to do that a lot better, a, a, more of a visual guy. Mm. Um, like this is how my Explain brain. Explain that to me. Okay, so yeah. yeah so this is how I, my brain I, I, works. I don't get that. It's weird, dude. So on my way here, I'm driving down um, the interstate, right, 76? Yeah. And I'm looking out the window and you see a field, Okay. And you look over that field, and you see a little rock pile out in the middle of that field, okay? Right. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, well, if there was water on top of that, that would be the sweet spot. Yeah. Or I see a little ditch, or I see something. Like, yeah. that's how my brain's working All the time. when I'm driving. All the time. And so I take that under the water when I'm out there in a boat and trying to visualize, even if it's not correct, it, in my mind, I think it's correct, and so I'm fishing it. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Y- you're well, maybe the, tricking the, your brain, you the, know what I mean? Because we can't see underwater, Right. I would, but, and I say the visual aspect of that fishing is always overlooked. So that's really cool that you're, that you're, that you're you know, mm-hmm. think, you know, always, always like that, always thinking that. And so for me, the most efficient way to fish those areas isn't with, I, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I, I will power fish. I don't mind doing that. I'll, I'll throw these, I haven't thrown this one yet, but I would throw yeah. some crankbaits, yeah. you know, but I just oh, yeah. feel better yeah. if I could pick up a drop shot and work that. Especially in areas that get a lot of pressure with baits like that. Yeah. Spinner baits, chatter baits, things like that. That's a confidence thing for you. That's all it is. That's a big confidence it thing is. for you. Um, but it is. But it all stems down to once you have that confidence, you have to have the right equipment. And I'm really particular when it comes to the equipment that I use when I'm drop shotting. So the rods have to be perfect. I only use two different action rods when I drop shot. And it's either going to be a medium light or a medium size spinning rod it's got to be seven foot okay um i really really like the the saint croix legend extremes oh yeah Sweet. i just cannot find a better rod and it goes it's all about your personal preference you know there's a lot of mm-hmm. g loomis fans and yeah. and uh kistler or whatever the case may be and they all make good differently right so right. i carry a size one size two size four and then a one eye these are the only sizes that I carry yep. when I'm nose hooking plastics. Yeah, and um, and four and, and the four is a small hook. Why not? It is. That would be a great plastic if you were wacky rigging a five inch cinco, perhaps. Yeah, because you need that beefy hook. Exactly. Yep. So talking about that leader length, one so, of the things that I do, Travis, um, is when I put my weight on wherever I want it, mm-hmm. I don't cut my tag end off. And then if I need to lengthen my leader, I have extra leader there to just lengthen it up. 
Or if I shorten it up. Why isn't that hook stick sticking straight out? Oh, it is. You're just not looking at it right. Okay. You ready? <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll work on that part. We'll um, straight that. out. <laughs> so I factor in the buoyancy of the plastic okay. when I tie my knot. I do like your theory about this. I cannot stand... A tag. I, I knew that. Or a I drop that. shot that has this device clip. on it. A clip. I want it to be a circle, full Tied. circle. Yeah. I want it to be able to spin. Yep. And I want to tie that on there because yep. if I get a snag, the whole purpose of that theory is to change your leader. Yeah. But also, if you get hung up, you get your hook back, Good. I guess. Well, yeah. I, I, I find you change it, your weights easier. Oh, yeah, but yeah, you're I right. I find it um, to tie it on. If I get a snag, you go over there, give it a nice little pop. Comes it out. comes out. Yeah. You're not lo- losing your weight. If, yeah. if you did that with that and popped it, it you would it, lose You would weight. lose it. Guaranteed. Uh, second of all, with that, with that technique, um, why I like to have it tied, okay, Yeah, is the fact that a lot of times I'm using the same size weight. Right. And so I'm not changing, right. changing right. weights. Exactly. And, again, we just mentioned it, those Great Lakes smallmouth, when he jumps out way out there, that He'll first thing to go off. is going to be the weight. He, he throws gonna, them off. You're going to go through 100 weights. And if it, you're fishing tungsten. In a week, yeah. Well, me and Spencer. George, me and George, we don't fish up there much, but when we go up, we that's what we have a lot of the, as those weights. Mm-hmm. We end up tying knots. Absolutely, yes. Around it because the, yeah. the, the fish, when they jump, they yep. just throw so it you, off. So all you can do is just do an uh, yeah. overhand maybe yeah. twice, and you're yeah. good, too. Yeah. Oh, now, let me, l- let me ask you something. Sinkers. I'm, let me ask you something about the hooks mm-hmm. because. So I just let them throw them. <laughs> I, heard you, I heard you talking. <laughs> about, you said something there. You said to me you, you have four different size hooks that you use. Mm-hmm. And you were like, well, and George tied on a 1-0. And for me, on a four-and-a-half-inch drop shot worm like that, I don't have a problem with a 1-0 on that. So okay. tell me why, why, why that's a problem. I don't want to have that hook as the uh, – focus point in that plastic and i don't want it to have a weight where it just brings that bait down there, i mean there's times be, be ten, we could take another so, bait like so, a dro- the hook, uh, so the hook when you're when you're drop shot and you let slack in it the hook weight's going to drop, sure. drop it down faster than what you like correct okay depending on the plastic every plastic reacts right. differently right. i would never use a, a one-odd hook on a robo worm that's insane for me yeah i, I would I would never. I wouldn't even throw it. Okay. I'd put the yeah. rod back in the box. No, I, 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 I want to know this stuff because. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just my opinion. Listen, you, I'm sure you caught no. more, way more fish on a drop shot than I have. No, I have over the years. I haven't. But if I'm, I'm using a robo worm, I'm going to use a size two. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I fished with a guy uh, last year, and he turned me onto a four. See how I hook at Travis? Mm-hmm. I'm not per se just nosing sure. it. So I'm kind of threading back in a little ways. I see that. Who's got the time to do that when you're catching fish on every <laughs> cast, though? Well, you know, I use these heavier duty hooks a little bit bigger. You because catch bigger fish. It's, it, 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 I mean, it goes to the turf. <laughs> right, right. It we, concerns me, you know, to use a trout fishing salmon. You would hook. be surprised how many. I don't. Oh, no, I know that. And I that's would what not. I, that hook is a monster hook. Yeah, we we just got we just got uh cut well, well I, actually I was cut off there but what we we fish with a guy from Mega Bass up at Lake Ontario every year in the fall. Ryan Buttermore. Ryan Buttermore and um he fishes a number 4 pretty much exclusively for all his he mm-hmm. fishes the um you have it there George the, the Mega Has-Dong. Bass has No, the uh Hasdong. Is it the Hasdong Shad? Yeah, the Hasdong Shad, you know, the smaller three-inch Hasdong. Yeah. And I'm telling you, that dude was catching some giants in that little bitty hook. And the idea behind that is that Not he, this past trip he wasn't. No, but this, what, his idea behind that was it's like a splinter. Mm-hmm. You know, it would get in the fish's mouth, and they can't use it for leverage and throw it. Sure. So you can catch a big fish on that, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And that's I, what you're saying? I don't. Yes. I. But, but are, you more, are you more concerned with presentation than you are with foot? Setting a hook and landing yeah, the fish. Yeah, a size four or a one odd is going to keep that fish pinned if you have the right rod set up and yeah. fighting it properly. Okay. Agreed. But you're going to have Fair a more enough. finesse application. I like. I just don't want to see a big, big hook yeah. on that. I just don't. You don't want to kill the action of the worm. Yeah, and I think those fish just, you know, man, they're they're getting smarter and smarter, or you know, fishing pressure or whatever the case may be. Now, how about when you Texas rig that worm? So I rarely will Texas rig a worm when I'm open water drop shotting. I How won't. about if you're in cover? Yes. Then I'm going to use 
something like, yeah, you got one right there. Yeah. Yep. The G Finesse is a great um, Robo Worm makes one. There's there's some that have the yeah. The Robo Worm is a, is a Gamagatsu. That was the original one, George. Yeah, it? they had their own little heat shrink. Yeah. They mm-hmm. cut on an angle. The yeah. rebar, fantastic hook. Yeah. Mm-hmm. On a medium wire, straight shank Gamagatsu. Gamagatsu. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you can go over and buy that hook off the wall over there for finesse fishing. Yep. And they took and put that little, and that's a fantastic hook. It is, and it's light. But the only time I'm going to do that is if I, I'm going to first attempt to fish that sparse grass or that brush pile with an exposed hook. And I'm going to do it as long as I feel I can. So and you're then, aggravated. And then when I have to, I'll switch over to a Texas rig. Well, your hookup ratio is better. With an exposed? Yes. Yeah. I, so. Well, these hooks, the, listen, there's guys that are going to disagree with me on this big time. And this is all they throw. Especially guys that are not way up north, but more, you know, Tennessee River guys, um, places like that where they'll run into, you know, Highland Reservoirs like on Lake Cumberland last year, wherever that was in Tennessee or yeah. Kentucky. Yeah. Um, there were some good brush piles. We were drop shot with a robo worm. Um, Matt Pangraff from BTL was throwing the robo worm just like me, and he was Texas rigging it with, with these types of hooks. And when I was fishing them exposed, and every night we'd get in an argument about that. Now, was he fishing the four-inch robo worm, or was he fishing the six-inch robo worm? He was fishing the, so he was using the six and the four, and okay. we used the same size hook. That that hook will fit in both. Yes, it will. Um, it wor- it looks better to me from a presentation standpoint, and just for my own, you know, mind. It, you know, if I was a Texas rig, I'd rather have a little bit bigger uh, plastic, you know, a longer one. What's the reason, George? That- and I have, we have a, a, one of our our, our, our uh, <coughs> customers here uh, watching, asking, why would you thread a drop shot worm on a hook? Why would so you do it gives that? that bait a totally different action than if you were like this? just to nose hook. Why, yeah, why would you thread it? Or threading it on like this. For, well, you know, um, one of the things that we saw in the last uh, last couple tournaments was a lot of guys using those bigger hooks and threading their baits on it. Mm-hmm. What was the whole idea behind that? It gives that bait a different action. Oh, it does? And you, you might not, like you're throwing, I haven't used these before, but this looks like a neat little goby imitator. Um, if you nose hook that, you're going to go through a lot more baits too. Every yeah. fish. Mm-hmm. So, so Mike, that, that another reason, like Travis was saying, it gives it a presentation because of the bait. For example, a lot of these people are threading on a... Baby Z2 from Strike King, and you have a lot of bulk. Yeah. You have that, that Z-Man style plastic, but you have a lot of bulk. The, the, the Z2, Baby Z2 is thick. So when you thread it on, your hook's still exposed, but, you know, imagine my finger is the, mm-hmm. is the bait. Yeah. You know, you don't have as much gap. And doing it that way, you are going to want a bigger hook because you want that gap with that plastic you're talking exactly. is a little thicker. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Back in the old days, uh, before we had this beautiful selection of hooks, I mean, the hook aisle, have you been down yeah. the hook aisle? I got lost. Is that awesome or what? <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Sometimes I just go back there and meditate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we get, do have a lot get of Get my chi there. right. But, yeah. you know. Yes. You go back in that, in that hook aisle and you, and you look at the five major manufacturers, you know, Hayabusa, Gamagatsu, Mustad, Owner, and... Um, Eagle Claw. True Car, yeah. And, I mean, they all, you know, Ford, Chevy, every, every hook style. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, just like this hook right here. You know, this is a... This has a coating on it to make it slippery. This has a, a lead casting to replicate what Robo Worm created with that piece mm-hmm. of heat shrink. And when Robo, Robo Worm did that, they did that on a hook very similar to this hook because they used a Gamagatsu hook. They still do. Yeah. So you can Texas rig with this or you can thread it on. And kind of getting back to the original question, why would you do one or the other? Well, that's it. If you're threading on for an open hook presentation, you want the gap because your bait's thicker. Okay. Or your Texas rigging, or okay. you're threading on like this yeah. with a traditional nose hook, yep. but you're threading it on so that you don't go through a bait yeah. on every fish. Mm-hmm. As 
uh, Travis pointed out. And if yeah. you're a fan of Berkeley Gulp uh, for drop shot and for smallies, if you don't thread it on like that, you better have buckets of gulp. Because <laughs> every smallie that comes up out of Lake tra- Ontario is going to go like this. Did, did you go there, Travis, this year? Where? Fl- the Berkeley Flatworm? Um, did you go there? Uh, other people in the boat have. Yeah. I have not gone you there. You didn't go there. I've gone there. I've gone with the, um, you know, that gulp is is still a very good bait. Okay. Kill um, the flat well, worm works. Well, that's what I've the max worm. It. The max worm is, is is a is a type of plastic that doesn't dry out. That delivers. It's a delivery system mm-hmm. for the gulp. So I didn't know if you if because I know you're a big, you fish the, the leeches and stuff like that up there. R- yes, and I'll tell you what. Regardless of the plastic I decided to throw for that day. So if I'm yeah. fishing. Uh, an Whatever. event, and I know that this dream shot's going to be the bait of choice. I will marinate that overnight in the gulp for sure. Oh, do you really? Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah, so you're a big believer of that. Dude, it's small when, mouth crack. When there's, when there's a tournament money on the line, Yeah, definitely. This man right over here is a, is a single-handedly turned me on to using scent again. I used to use it a long, long time ago, and, and um, Corbin's choice is what, what Corbin? Which one? Your choice of scents that, that oh. we use all the time. Well, if it's stained water, we use that uh, dip and dye with the chartreuse tail. No, no. Garlic scent, or are you talking yeah. about the... Uh, what do we use all the time when we craw- dip our... Oh, the crawl anise. Jeez, oh, man. I mean, well, I mean I wasn't what the sure. hell do I got to do? Well, I wasn't sure which route you I were mean, going down, bitch, man. That's, I mean, that's what you're known for. Well, I mean, I'm keeping a PG, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we, we know it is something else here. But that, you know, that single-handedly changed... The, I mean, I've seen it. Right. You know, when it came down to that kind of stuff. Travis, I, so, may, I may or may not have just put the hook so, of hair so, dig on that and casted it out, you know. Yeah. So um, what, what I'm wondering about they now is size of bait. Okay. You know, um, because I'm sure you have a, like, I saw your boxes. You showed, you showed your boxes sure. to people. Yep. They're loaded with different baits. They are, but it's it's not as a big of selection as you think. But there's si- there's a lot of sizes in there. Correct. There's yes. a few sizes, mm-hmm. and you know everything from small to big. And so, what what makes you start out with a certain? Say say you were going up in June. You were just getting there, end of June. You were done with the Chesapeake Bay. You were going up there, mm-hmm. and you're going to go out and you're going to test the waters. And it's post spawn, and you're just jumping on some of these rock piles. What would be the first bait you go to? And so why? Uh, it would be a goby. Uh, probably a, like a four inch uh, goby imitating plastic. That would be, that's especially for deep water fish. That's going to be something I would be using up there at least. So your 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 robo style worms you're using more for largemouth. Yes, most of the time. Yes, although yep. they will bite it. I just yeah. again, it's a confidence thing. Yeah. You can go up to Lake Ontario with robo worms and whack on them. Yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, you can. There's a goby style bait. Absolutely, that's what I would be throwing. Sh- now, show that out there, George. For shallow water fish on the Great Lakes, it, it does change a little bit. Is this what you consider a goby style bait? I do. Um, is yeah, that, this is, is that the smallest bait you would throw. No, but this is a pretty standard. This is a three and a half. This is the uh, the half shell. I I picked this color. Because it's actually, if you were going to buy a uh, a half shell, that would be the... That's the one you want to go with. That's the color you want. That's like... That's the KVD kick. Yeah, that's Those like... Those melon colors... Kind of wherever you go, you can catch them. On clear body of water, clear yes. Clear body that's of water, That's the yep. deal. Yep. Uh-huh. Melon with gold flake. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. That's what that is, basically. Yep. And then... Well, this was another... I, I grabbed some of these Z-Man finesse plastics because I maybe after if we have some time I wanted to talk about some some other finesse plastics that okay. I would use besides drop shot either. okay um let's just keep pushing I, let's keep pushing on the drop shot is that so that that would be also here. for that yep, there yep so um okay so we can talk about some of this stuff here yeah I mean let's let's know, talk large what, mouth it, real quick oh that's that's a large mouth deal there so yeah so a centipede mm-hmm. french fry whatever you want to call it it has the the Dumbest action, if you look at it in a, in a fish tank underwater, mm-hmm. on the drop shot, it just Dump. lays there. Lays there. doesn't do anything. But for some reason, they suck that thing in. Texas um, rig it most of the time with that? No, this is nose hook. Still, still nose hook? Oh, wow. What hook? I would not have guessed that. This will be a size uh, size one. That's interesting. 
Size one. Now, are you just going to nose hook it, or are yes. you going to thread it like nope. a like I'm going to nose hook it. No. Okay, so you buy lots of centipedes. I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's Charles, another one. Do you, These do you are, ever wacky rig those centipedes? I do, yes. That's a great wacky mm-hmm. rig, mate. Yep. That's a good point. These Reigns bubble shakers, now they make a lot of small, they make some three inch yeah, as well. Yeah. I, I yeah. just grabbed this off your shelf because uh, a five inch morning dawn, if you're fishing around largemouth uh, and you want to try it. drop shotting for largemouth, these types of baits, your your six inch robo worms, yeah. well, even this one will work. Um, yeah. Heck, even a power worm would, yeah, would sure. be great on a they drop shot. Uh, they do a big. Dream shot, a five inch dream yes, shot I've that's available yep. in the morning dawn. So, I don't. I prefer. I prefer this size. I'm talking for largemouth. Yeah, I prefer this size. A four inch. Okay. Yeah, I do. Um, um, the other, the other nice worm that I think for drop shot and for a bigger worm, other than the robo worm, which is a fantastic worm, is the trick worm from Zoom. Mm, yep, that's a good drop shot worm. Absolutely. Also, for your Texas rigging of a largemouth. Largemouth. Mm-hmm. Now you wouldn't nose hook a, tr- a trick worm. Sure you would. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. He's a nose hooker all day okay. long. I'm. Yeah. I'm. Listen. Rick, I'm either. He's gonna go get pierced one of these. I'm days either wacky really. rigging these baits or I'm nose hooking them. And like I said, when I have to Texas rig them, I will. But man, that's rare for me to have to do that. I can go out in the flats with a no, with a nose hooked uh, robo worm and feel just at at home because it's how you pitch that bait next to that cover. Mm. You're gonna get hung up a little bit, but man, sometimes that's the the best part about it is getting that little and then pulling it Pop free. It and yeah. then just let it sit there. Because you know they're looking mean? at it. Yeah. When you're popping on it. That's Yeah. And that's curiosity. another thing. That goes back to my style of fishing. I'm not covering a bunch of water. I'm trying to locate key areas, and then I'm sitting there most of the, most of the days. I'm picking those apart because we go through – we go past way too many fish. There's thousands of fish living around your boat all the time, and you're yeah. just going to go ahead to the next spot. And especially on a, a body of water that gets so much pressure, your next spot's probably been covered up three, four, five times sure. already that day. So I feel no reason to really uh, – I'm never in a rush when it comes to – you know, I gravitate towards that style of fishing over a running gun approach. Have you encountered the morning dawn Sanko with less salt than a standard Sanko? No. So I, I've heard about it, but I don't Oof. know much about it. Wow. I will I'm, tell I'm going to show you one. Please do. Um, so this is kind of interesting to me because – What's more important to you, the the size of the bait or the color? Or the action, buoyancy, and the quality. All of it. All, all of it. it. All of I mean, so you say, you say, and I've seen your box, it's not like crazy colors in there. No, There's I'm going like to have a whole. I'm going to have my green pumpkins, of course. Yeah. I'm going to have my black and blues. Yeah. I'm going to have my straight blacks. Yep. I'm going to have my melon, and I'm going to have some crazy Something. color. Whether Something. it be, you know, I don't. Yeah. I mean, why not? We're why, we can talk about some things here. Morning yeah. dawn. Everybody's throwing morning dawn, right? Everybody's you ever hear on morning it. sunshine, or how about some other crazy? Yeah, right. Methylate, just some methylate. Yeah, pink, oh, right. right? Right. You got to have a crazy color in that right. box. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, that's morning, a good point. Morning dawn, Sanko. Yeah. That's a that's a that's a great point for everybody watching. You know, oh, we get low salt. We get the question I all the time it. in here about color, color, color. What color would you? What color? You know. There's, there's a handful of colors. If you guys pay attention to what people are talking about and reading about, you'll see there's a handful of colors that are must-haves. And he just said kind of like four of, of what I always suggest. Of basics that you need to the have. The basics you got to have. And, and with those basics, for a lot of guys who don't are just getting into it, because, you know, we have a lot of beginning customers are coming in. And plus, since COVID, there's a lot of people just getting into fishing. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to go out and buy like $10,000 worth of stuff. This is stuff that we gathered all over the years so there's a few colors that are very important to have and come into a pro shop like susquehanna fish and tackle or any pro shop but susquehanna fish and tackle you can come in here and we're going to dial you into two or three of the specific colors but you're going to get different shapes and sizes and that's what we're all about too is a lot of the shapes and sizes mm-hmm. lengths and stuff like that so that was I, you know that was kind of cool because I, I i watched travis's uh show a lot his live show and he does delve into a lot of that that tackle side of things and 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 you show your boxes and that's what's mm-hmm. kind of cool because i always thought you were like really tight man no you know, i always thought you were really really tight i gave with it your, all up so i think stuff, so so you know if i had to give any advice as far as colors and, and where to start so let's take my cinco box yep 
I'm going to have, let's, let's just forget drop shot for a second. I just want to make this point when it comes to plastic colors. Yeah. So my single box is going to be 4-inch, 5-inch, 6-inch, and 7-inch, okay? Mm -hmm. It's going to be black and blue, straight mm -hmm. black, and a green pumpkin. That's my standard box. So if I decide to go to a, a random lake in upstate New York, yeah. or if I want to go to Ohio, or I'm just picking places, right. I got my standard yeah. stuff. But then my initial research, when I'm doing research on that body of water, let's say we're going to a, a Gundersville. And keyword, a buzz term keeps coming up, tequila sunrise, whatever, whatever. Then I know, okay, I need to carry some tequila sunrise with me for yeah. this, this specific lake because that seems to be the color there. Right. But I always just have my main colors ready to go. Exactly. That at least I know I'm at a good starting point if I didn't do any research because there's always going to be key colors for, and, and every body of water is different. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely, it does. And and, and that's why a shop that's like why ours. You have to have an auction every now and again. <laughs> well, that, well I mean, that's, honestly, that's why there's a shop like there is. We have a shop like this, and it's because we have to carry all those colors for all the different countries or mm -hmm. uh, uh, states in the country. Yep. You know, all across the country, there's different. There's like specific for this, specific for that. But Absolutely. if you went to those same places and threw a green pumpkin, you're probably going to catch something. Probably. It's not going to be like you're not going to catch anything. On right. Because green yep. pumpkin. And, Kind of like universal mm -hmm. everywhere you go. Sure. You know, so. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Um, as well as black, blue. Black and blue. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's all great stuff. All right. Let's talk a little bit about, we did touch on your setup. Okay. So, yeah. So the rod and reel combo, right? I like a 3000 series reel. Yeah. Um, the Shimano, the old CI4s were always a yep. reel I gravitated Beautiful. towards. Okay. You're going to have to get into the Vanford. I will. I yeah. will be. Um, there's nothing wrong with... Uh, you know that that reel in that price range is probably ideal. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have a six hundred dollar no. reel, but I, I wouldn't trust a, I wouldn't trust a sixty seventy. Because drag reel. drag is very important. A absolutely, the Just, small hooks. Yep. The light line, mm -hmm. the whole nine. You gotta you gotta be ready. You gotta have that. And if there's one rod, is that it? That is the mythical wow. beast. Yeah. So if there is one rod, what would it be? A seven foot medium. Medium. If you could, if, if you could only and it would probably be a Saint Croix, at least for me. Um, yeah, I saw this too. So Travis, <laughs> yeah. one of the things that we've talked Will's about. I'm really going to spend any money here today. But. <laughs> that's that's getting in trouble there. Travis, so, one of the things that we've talked about in here a lot is the seven foot medium. I'm sorry, the seven foot medium fast Saint Croix, mm -hmm. and. What's interesting, like like a lot of rod companies, you can go to a Daiwa, you can go to a Shimano, you can go to the St. Croix, a 7-foot medium fast Legend Extreme, you know, $630, or a 7-foot medium fast Avid. Mm -hmm. That taper is identical. Same. It's a different material. Mm -hmm. It's a different weight. Mm -hmm. It's a different sensitivity level, mm -hmm. but the power and the taper are identical. Right. So a guy looking to get a quality <clears throat> Travis Manson recommended multi-purpose finesse spinning rod can buy an Avid at 200 bucks and have a bad-to-the-bone 7-foot medium fast if he doesn't want to spend Legend Elite or Legend X, or Legend Extreme, or Legend Tournament prices. Mm -hmm. But on the same note... Do you agree with that? No. Oh, my God. Sorry, I had to go there. Controversy. <laughs> Let's just talk about it, guys. So Let's be you, real on if this. You yeah. were buy <laughs> a, I was if, ask. if you were going to have one high-end rod in your arsenal, okay, it would. I would want you to have that being a, a finesse, whether it be throwing Ned Rigs or any bottom content bait or a drop shot, you want the best that's out there. Mm -hmm. If you're throwing chatter baits and reaction baits and things mm -hmm. like that, fine. Yeah. But the best you can afford. I, I agree with that, too. That you should be to. your number now, one. Now, listen, you, I'm not saying you can't get away with a $200 like you just said. Absolutely. But you said what I'd recommend yeah. that, and now, you can't. Um, I specifically asked if you. I could not. Now, you'd have, you'd and, have to and get, you're talking on that one rod, you're talking because of the importance of the sensitivity. And just man, you're gonna you're gonna drop shot all the time if you have this in your hand. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why are you gonna? Yeah. That's you like, what you're yeah. gonna do, man. That's this like, is an amazing setup right here. Yeah. Well, Mike and I have been fishing <laughs> that rod all year. We have been. And uh, AG, we're very AGS impressed. guides. I know. 
it's unbelievable. You know, so we are also fishing it in a casting version, and that's been pretty impressive. Interesting. So, um, wow, Travis, do you ever drop shot with the bait caster at all? Like power shot? And sure. Any of that? Yeah, you power know, for, shot for largemouth and yeah, heavier cover. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, where where you would maybe flip a half ounce weight or a three quarter ounce weight. That's when I would yeah. I, I would use that technique. Yeah. So that does come into play. Now that's not my. That's I I, I am you know. I'm just like anyone else when it comes to flipping and pitching and stuff like that. If you, I'm not, I don't think I'm an expert when it comes to power shotting. It's a mm-hmm. technique I use. It works. Another thing we should talk about is the line on these. Yes. On these, okay. Yeah, exactly. So fantastic. And I don't. Again, if if you can't afford a high end, don't be disappointed. You know those those lower ends, the two hundred dollar rods are gonna work, but. The Abbott is fantastic. I mean, listen, I on my live show, I had a, a rod I was trying to sell, and it retails for $40. This first guide on here is worth more than $40 on this St. Croix, okay? So it's all about how it's, you know, the construction just, I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible tool that you have in your hand. When you're fishing, this is what you're fishing with, okay? It's just as important as, as everything else that we're talking about as far as hooks and things like that, but this rod... And having the right rod, you just you're going to come along with the rod, and that's why I like to have all mediums or medium lights. I want to be able to pick up an all seven foot, and maybe you're you're a little shorter, and you want a six ten, and you feel more comfortable with that. Then fine, but you're gonna I think you're gonna enjoy the experience out there if you keep all your rods consistent. Whether or not okay, let's say I'll drop shot this with this rod, and I'll throw a tube with this rod. There's a lot of applications with this exact seven foot medium. And I want it to feel the same when I pick up my next bait in my hand. I want to I want to have that exact action and that length. So I don't differ too much from that. Um, Sounds like yeah. a lot, lot like Bryson D. Ban Show from golf. All his clubs are the same length, mm-hmm. one of a kind. That's all he does. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I I I, I kind of feel what you're saying, and and I respect about your, you know, your main tool needs to be the the best you can lay hands on, but having experienced a lot of the St. Croix product over the years, a lot, and spent a lot of times with it, you know, that $200 Avid price point, man. It is good. It yes. is. And it, and if you line it up as you're as you're about to delve into with Braid, mm-hmm. you even supersonic that sensitivity even mm-hmm. a little more. And listen, I do love this extreme, but I, I, I want to give you guys a hint, uh, a little... A situation that came up recently with me is because I love those old green legend St. Croix extremes, but they don't make them anymore. And yeah. so when you yeah. fish every day like me and have clients, you're going to break a few rods. Well, guess what? Now when I break one, it ain't the same. I'm no. in a predicament. Yep. Okay? So <laughs> I'm actually going to be gravitating towards the St. Croix lineup of rods, but I'm not sure if I'm settled quite on this one. I know right. the legend X rods are amazing. Excellent. Um, Excell- excellent rods. Legend so- Elite. Legend Elite, so I'm actually looking at those options as we speak. Yeah. Now, that is the same blank as your mm-hmm. Legend Extreme. Yes, yes. But the guide train is different. Correct. And the handle. And, and the, the handle? handle's a little different the now. The handle's different. Uh, hair jig with that. I'm yeah. throwing a, a one-tenth size Ned rig with yeah. that. I'm throwing a little Kitech finesse jig with that. Yeah. Um, that's just going to allow you to better cast. That's also going to allow you to drop down to that fish quicker when you're in deeper water. So Less resistance. Yeah. Less resistance yeah. all the way around. We, we, I totally get that. You're not breaking a five-pound braid. You can take a five-pound braid, and, and you're not breaking it. You're going to cut your, your skin open. That might that might explain your hook sets. Well, we, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. <laughs> now, on my medium size rod, yep. because a lot of times I'm actually casting, yep. and I'm throwing tubes and fishing some heavier cover with that, mm-hmm. large mouth as well, yep. I'm going to go with eight pounds. So I'll just step it up slightly. Wow. That's about as heavy a braid you'll ever see me throw on my spinning reel. Wow. Oh, wow. That's great. Whoa. Yeah. That's great. That's six, eight, like... Six, eight, ten, twelve pound leader. Majority of the time, eight for small mouth. You can do six. What, I mean, I'm going to be honest you, What knot are you Here's using? Theory. What knot are you using? Okay, that's a good question. And we debate about that all the time on my live show because I don't know the name of knots. I just know how to tie it. And I use my tongue, and it's, it's a very uh, unique way that I tie it. <laughs> But I can tie it in under ten seconds. I don't know. We is can, that we can bet on that, Travis? I can tie it in under ten seconds. Is that um, George? George, you want to go double or nothing on last <laughs> night's bet? No, I I uh, I took a beating on that Ohio State game last <laughs> night. I'm uh, I'm in re- regroup mode right now. So six, eight, ten, or twelve, 
10 I'm, to 12 is, is going to be my largemouth setup if I'm drop shotting more, more often than not, especially if you're fishing around less structure. So tra- Travis ties a granny knot in 10 seconds. It could with be. This. <laughs> I, could be a granny. But he likes the knot. But he likes the knot. I do. And I, I, I wish I had a name. I, it might be the Albright or the San Diego Jammer. I, I really don't know. Okay. Okay? Don't but, know. But it holds up. It does. It doesn't slip. doesn't. Mm-mm. How long is your leader? Okay. Um, hmm. So what I like about these new extremes and the, I think, 2018 and up, prior to that, they had the really small micro guides. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it was fine if you're making direct cast or even if you're dropping straight down. You can get away with those smaller guides. Yeah. But if you're trying to pitch a drop shot underhand to a piece of structure, mm-hmm. that knot is going to get caught a lot yep. when you're flipping a spinning reel. Okay. A rod. Yes, it is. I agree 100%. Okay? Yes, and it so is. you have to have a bigger guide. I don't care how small of a knot that you think you can tie. You have to have the right eyelets, I guess. You know, the, yeah. the uh, diameter. The diameter has to be perfect. So where were we going with that? We're talking about your leader length. Leader length. For largemouth, and I would say eight. Eight foot, six to eight. I don't need a whole lot. For smallmouth, you really could get away with that. I don't feel comfortable with it. I like maybe a 10 to 12. But I'm not like, I'm not taking a, a measuring, you know, a right. ruler right. and, and right. making sure it's right. accurate every time. Right. I'm just kind of going with the flow. And if, if yeah. I know, hey, I'm going to get hung up a lot today. Make it a little longer. Let's make it a little longer. Because you're going to retie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I retie every night and before tournaments on all 12 of my spinning rods. And so oftentimes that's why I'm up until midnight because I'm going over everything and being very precise with my knots. And mm. I'm testing it too. Once you, once you tie that knot, okay, I have to pull it and it, you know, yeah. it does break sometimes. Yeah. More often than not, yeah. it breaks. And I do that in a, a tournament. I'll pull on that thing and until then you I go, know. And then you got to go back to tying it. And again. you have to go back and tie it, but it's got to be perfect. Yeah. Oh. It's got to be perfect. And once you have that perfect knot, you can get away with using it for quite a while as long as you keep testing it. Mm-hmm. It'll stay for days. Mm-hmm. Just like your braid. Today's braid, I'll fish it all year long. Oh, yeah, now, no problem. I'll, I'll re, you know, I'll take it all out and, and reel backwards and, and use that, that. Other side, yeah. The other side. Yeah. Uh, but I really don't have to spool up too much. I, I actually, believe it or not, I hate admitting this, but this year with the, uh, with live scope and the electronics, I found myself spooling up a little more often than I'd like because um, the trolling motor likes to, uh, we Eat. call it Jaws. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how many times, man. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. tell you Hold right your, now. See, you we were just talking about like that this. today. How I'm going to tell you right now. So how locked on you are with, the, with that yeah, kind of stuff. Like, mm. 20, at least, I hate minute. I don't care. Because <laughs> everyone else that does this, I know they, they deal with the same thing. I've probably <laughs> lost 20 spools this year. <laughs> Sometimes four in a day, dude. Four in a day. Four in a day. And well, you know how pissed I get, dude? Because I already, I know. I'm, like, conscious of it. I'm watching myself all the time. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, whoa, there he is. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, wait. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, meanwhile, Travis. you're looking at the Garmin. And, and Go ahead, Corbin. We, we, heard, we heard rumors earlier that you were, um, you know, idling along and have a portable panoptics by the console to throw over the side yeah. somebody had said a couple things like that sure you know you didn't get anything caught in that did you no it, it no. didn't get caught in your prop <laughs> no, no 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 i just wanted to make sure i've had had my underwater camera get cut off by the main prop twice on my life as well as <sighs> that's happened too with the actual big motor ouch yeah well ouch. me and george were talking about today <laughs> with with a with a customer about about panoptics and how one of the one of the complaint not a complaint but one of the things that that the fishermen are, are, are acknowledging is it's taken away the fishing, you know what I mean? The fishing. Uh, no, I don't know what you mean. I go out there and I want to set the hook. I know, but it takes away like when you're struggling and you're trying to find fish. I and disagreed with him as sti- well. You're sti- he does. He does. He does. But how many times, how many, well, maybe that never happened to you, but how many times you fishing along and then out of the corner of your eye, you saw some fish busting on, on a, sure. on a, well, on there's a certain ele- certain different levels of awareness. I think yeah. you can oh, do the both. awareness. I think that's a good word. Yeah, I think you can you can look at your graph just like I do. I I'm always visualizing what's down there besides what the graph is showing me. So, it, and that just takes practice. Being you yeah. know 
like in this building right now, if there was some a mouse running across the floor over there and we're having a conversation, I would have noticed it. Okay, that's how tuned in I am to my surroundings at all that's times. That's what I told Mike. I'm, I'm like, you know, if I'm staring at that screen and working down the grass line and I hear a, you know, that classic, Mm-hmm. I know exactly where that fish but is. More often 30 than feet not. behind the boat. You don't even you know. see that, though. I mean, I'm talking about bait skipping. I'm talking about a swirl. I don't care I'm about anything about... except that fish that's 50 feet out in front of me, and I want to make sure I get that drop shot right on his face. Okay, but for instance, here, here's a story. Bait fish over here. Here's a story for you. This is, this is a pretty important story. Okay. George went out to um, um, Mississippi River fishing in, uh, what was that town up there, George? Quincy, Illinois. Quincy, Illinois. And he was fishing the Mississippi River in a Many very, ago. very big tournament, qualifying for the Bassmaster Classic, mm-hmm. and he and he and he got locked out. So he 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 practiced and found some spots to go to while blocked out of the of a lock. So he went over to this place and he's fishing along, fishing this, fishing that, and then out of the corner of his eyes, he sees this swirl on this log. Okay, he turns, takes a boat over there, throws in, catches a six pounder. They don't catch six pounders up there. Right, they're not oh, even there. Sure, sure. It was like aliens put it in there last night. Booger man. Without him seeing that awareness, mm-hmm. you know, um, ringworm. That's what I think everybody's saying about that type of uh, uh, sonar is that it's taken away a lot of the awareness that okay. fishermen have. And maybe you don't have that problem, but I could see a lot of people. Well, you do somewhat because you're winding all the line up in your props, bro. So yeah. some of your situational I mean, awareness you argue, is taken how away. How do you argue that? I don't I mean, know. I mean, some he of buys are taken away. <laughs> well, I don't mind selling you a line. That's right, cool. Right. But <laughs> um, yeah, so you're right. That's all I'm saying. Sure. I thought you were going a different direction, meaning, you know, it's it's easier now to catch fish and no. this and that. And they're, they're no, at no. I'm talking about. Okay. Not at all. I'm talking okay. about the instincts. That's not the direction. I'm talking about the instincts of fishermen. Sure. You have instincts when you go fishing. And a lot of those instincts are in your gut. You know, you people talk about gut. Talk about senses, you know, all the senses of being an outdoorsman, right? There's senses that you use as an outdoorsman that people don't use that are all like yeah. office people. So, right. But right? my instincts now, when I'm when I'm tracking a fish out deep, or I'm looking at my my graph and I see something that could be a fish, or maybe it's a, a yeah. boulder. Yeah. That's my new instinct now. Is I better go over there and focus. No, on that I get a that. Bit, I I totally maybe get it. Slow super down. No, we got the best graphs out there, but no, no, I, I, I get, I get incorporating. I'm just saying the awareness mm-hmm. that needs to be remembered. Right. That's where I was going with that. I agree. So we agree on that. Yeah, we agree on that. So, mm-hmm. so I am really, really super shocked, bro, about the line weight. Why? I just blows what, me. What are you going to throw twenty pounds? I don't know. Why? I'm just like um, no, but ten for me. Sure, ten. Listen, ten for me is a light line. Yeah, well, ten's not even much more than this. I, no, I, know, I, I, I got fifteen it. or less. You're good. Well, just so, for me, I, I got to have that setup. So that makes it's sense. Just what I'm used to. Your your hook set that I've watched you do a million times right? for drop shotting up on the up on the lakes by watching all your videos, mm-hmm. um, is this walking pulling. Pretty much. Covering some some area. Sometimes it's yes, I, and people it, have commented they on do, it. They, they do. commented on it. It's like what you the ever hell kind of upset? A whole yeah. other story. Yeah, yeah. duck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so the proper. But, no, but 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 I have I have a feeling that a lot of it has to do with the number of times you broke off. Mm, no, I think it's it's the number of times not getting that hook in that fish's mouth, not okay. breaking off. So you, you can only set the hook so hard on. No, five I, pound so I braid. See, so guiding up there with you know people from all over the place with different levels of experience, the biggest mistake I see is when they get that bite is their standard hook set like you're fishing a tube or a Ned rig, right? And that's not what you do. At least that's not what I would recommend. When you feel that bite, all you're doing, all you do is reel, and then step back. Yeah. And then as you lift. I guess I go up on my tippy you toes. Do. Okay, have, I'm guilty. You have, you have a great walk, buddy. Some people it's don't good. don't need to get on their tippy toes. It's just a habit of mine, I guess. It's, it's perfect. It's beautiful. And I didn't realize that until I just demonstrated it now in slow motion, but that's how I do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I and, saw and the elevation. If, it was, if, it was awesome. if somebody can teach me how For the that, love of elevation. If somebody <laughs> can teach me how when you flip that bail and you grab that line yeah. and then make a cast yeah. like that, which is so foreign yeah, to me. It's like. If you can teach me how to do that. Travis is one of these chuckers, George. Yeah, no, I grab it with this hand. Yeah. And then I chuck the bait and out And he there. chucks it out. He, he's a chucker. Every cast. He's not a caster. He's a chucker. Really? Yeah. I have to grab the line here and let it go here. 
Wow. I will never use my finger. Yeah. I cannot use yeah, my he's, finger to cut. He's cast. like, he's like, wow. There's stuff going on. It's like, it's like something you see from like. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're, yeah. It's the way I taught my kids when they were like five and six years old to cast. It's like Jim Sears golf swing, man. It's just very unorthodox. It is. Unorthodox. It hey, works you know what, though? Hey, it Ooh, works it for you, right, bro? It's perfected. It yeah. It's perfected. George, should I go get the rod we can teach Travis to cast with? <laughs> no, no, honestly, that was a joke. I will never fish that way. I, I, I can't do it. So, um, That's the way it is. One thing we that we over overlooked today, and uh, you know, was our sponsor George for the oh. sec second week in a row. Yeah. So yeah, we want to jump in here, take a little commercial break here. We've got uh, the signs up for everybody to see. I do. I do. We have we have a sponsor who has two businesses that uh, we're representing. We have uh, Love Shack Hunting Blinds, uh, which is a division of. Benjamin's Country Store, which has a cool slogan, the best hoagies in Harrisville. And you might ask, where's Harrisville, Maryland? Well, Harrisville, Maryland, the people in Harrisville, Maryland ask, where's Harrisville? Harrisville, Maryland is right as you're coming into Rising Sun, Maryland. So as you're coming into Rising Sun, Maryland, um, check out. Benjamin's Country Store get the best hoagie and if you're a we, deer hunter we had them here blind, they were they were fantastic, they were fantastic. Yeah. check out uh, the Love Shack hunting yep. blinds they'll deliver yep uh, they bring your blind in for you they set it up and they even leave you a bag of hoagies in the blind so Absolutely. I mean you know it's all good Absolutely. we want we want to thank Bruce Lovelace and the team at, there at uh, Benjamin's store and uh, for being a sponsor of Tackle Shop Live Tackle Shop Live thanks Benjamin we appreciate it man. Okay, so um, one of the questions here we have, or, or, or comments, I should say, is that uh, on your hook set, uh, let's see if I can find it here real quick. Oh, shoot. What, uh, William Clute calls it the, uh, oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, I lost it. Uh, oh, Bill. Oh, here it is. No, wait. Bill, do, put that in here again, because he called it some kind of triple-toed shuffle. <laughs> the the triple, the triple Lutz, the triple ending. The triple toe shuffle, he, he calls it. Uh, come on, Bill, put that back in here again for us. Uh, but anyway, um, everybody's uh, commenting on how, how uh, awesome the information is. Uh, oh, the triple T shuffle. <laughs> triple T shuffle from Bill. Cunningham. I like it. I like it. That's your man. Yeah. Okay. You know... We can't forget about the weights, drop shot weights, no, and we haven't even talked about still, that yet, so I'm getting nervous because no, I want to yeah, make sure we still, cover all this. Dude, we're okay. still deep. Okay, good. We're still deep, man. We're still okay, good. deep in the process here. We're As only 124. Fact, okay. If you'll I, notice, I brought up. We've been known to go two, two, two and a half. Guy. We're never going to go seven like or whatever you right. guys did. Fair four. Enough. I just got What nervous. was that? Was that a four? I don't know, man. They did a four and a half a couple weeks ago, and I was like, I'm out. <laughs> All right. So wait, what 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 I brought a few I brought a few yep. up yeah. for you to use as sure. uh, props. Samples. Okay, perfect. So I know why they don't have the eye on you like, but No, that's fine. Why um, do you, why okay. do you think there's different shapes? Okay, so well that's easy. The, there's there's different shapes like a a a cylinder or maybe this kind of I guess what would you call that? A bell. Kind of a bell. Bell shaped yeah, or, or a hybrid. type of thing. Yeah, hybrid. hybrid. Bell teardrop, teardrop hybrid. You call these pencils or what do you call them? Cylinders. That? Cylinder cylinders. Weights? Sure. Yep. Um, so let's start out with where I'm mostly drop shy, and that's deep water, okay? Mm -hmm. Most of the time. Yep. And there's still a shallow – oh, my God, there's so much to go with. Take yeah. a deep breath. Okay. Yeah, so take your time. for the this. weights, for the weights, when I'm fishing deep, it's more than likely a 5 eighth ounce or heavier. Okay. Okay. Mm. And it's the cylinder, pencil. What are we yep. calling that? That's a that's cylinder. That's a cylinder. cylinder. With, now, could and, you please define And you want deep. the – Pro style. 20 or deeper. Oh, wow. So you're going 5 8 even in shallow as 20 foot. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, cool, cool. Only so, because, and that's when I'm seeing them on the graph. You want to get to them. them. I want that bait just to fall right down there as quick as possible. Is that ring a ring guy called the Pro Series, George, can we say? Um, it's a casting. Oh, casting. Drop shot Casting weight. drop shot weight. Okay. So when you get when when you get a. When you want to order them, that's why we break breaking drop this, shot change it. With the ring eye, it's a casting. Casting drop style, shot yeah. Weight. Okay, yep. As opposed to a traditional clip on clamp, 
plan. And, and we mentioned that a little bit, and you don't get carried away with that. That's just no. that's no, just I, my preference. But that, well, and, 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 that, and you can important. use the clip and tie a knot. In. Travis, mm-hmm. that's very important. When fish mm-hmm. start jumping, it's annoying. A lot of the times, you lose the weight for no reason at all. Absolutely. Yes. So that's a great. Uh, that's a great. Mm-hmm. But if you tie, if you tie onto your clip on, you can tie onto your clip on. Clip on. So you don't have to go out does, and buy new weight. It weights. does make it a little bit weaker though at times. Because it's pinching the line there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's it's going to be that weight. It's going to be lead only because I go through. I literally buy uh, bulk three to four five hundred count bags. Oh yeah. Okay. So tungsten or lead? Lead. Lead. Because it's just uh, just a price. It's a Pricey. price deal. Yeah. It's I'm out there every day. Yeah. If if I could afford it and had the luxury, I would definitely choose tournament tungsten. fishing. What would you use? I, I use still lead, the lead? Okay. most of the time right. when I'm fishing deep. Yeah, so do I. Um, yeah, we use a lot. We use lead all the time. On George. drop shot. Yeah, a lot of times time. it's that it's that lead colored. Okay, so what yeah. I like to do is I like to uh, if I have the time, I will I will powder coat it black. Ooh. Because I just feel I feel better about the whole situation for some reason. Okay, I, I won't. That's a commitment. Yeah. Powder coat and 500 cylinder drop yes. shot weights. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Better man than me, brother. That's, that's <laughs> now, it, and, and the straight normal lead look will work, but if I'm in a tournament, I'm dulling that thing down. Okay. Well, you can throw them in a can of Coca Cola. Could you? Yeah. Now, don't smell the fumes because it's okay. extremely toxic. Interesting. But it will turn them into a. Now, I. Uh, Charcoal looking. At color. the same time, I don't want to get the wrong impression that there isn't a time and place for uh, all lead, nice shiny weight. Maybe even Texas rigging. Oh just yeah. Saying. yeah. Okay. That's the Bobby Lane technique. Yeah. Uh, Shining them weights. I just I, we don't want to go there. But you yeah. know, also if you want to dull your shiny tungsten weight, you can also take a torch to that. George, who was the guy that, that I fished with the 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 guy down and that showed me how to punch. I think you missed the torch. Huh? Yeah, that was. A, that was I think you missed thing. the key. What was torch. his name? No, you're 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 one step ahead of the. That's crowd okay. Here. No, we'll no, I'm ta- I'm, no, I'm talking about. I'm talking about the torch. The chrome. That was Bobby Lane. No, 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 no. Bobby Lane made it famous. He right. did. He, he shining have... his weights. The guy with the tiger shirt. The pro with the tiger shirt. Oh no 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 no. Who's no, the pro no, with no, the tiger Steve shirt? Kennedy. Steve Kennedy. Okay. In 2005, told me that he polishes his weights. He calls it the chrome and blue. This is a chrome mm. with a blue, sure, punching lug. So, so Travis, so right, Travis was, was bringing ahead. up a key factor here. Key factor. Go if, ahead. If you if you I have totally screwed that if up. If you have tungsten weights and you feel like maybe it's too shiny, I believe on some. I don't know if it varies by brand because some maybe not are all 100% tungsten. I don't know if it's a coating. But I found that sometimes you can take a torch to it and it'll, it'll blacken doll, it. Doll down. You got a lot going on out there in that shop, don't you? Right. <laughs> you're torching, but it, you're dipping. We're getting yeah, deep, and it, it, it'll deep work. into the head of Travis Manson. It'll work. <laughs> um, so now, if you want to avoid all that extra labor, just don't drop shot. There you go. But don't <laughs> so, be don't so listen, be in the so, same tournament Travis is in. So five eighth ounce weight, more than likely. I'll go down to a half at times. I will use three quarter and one ounce, especially if it's super windy and I'm using a specific drop shot bait. So let's say I'm let's say I have a five foot leader on a wacky rig five inch Senko in thirty feet of water with six foot rollers, and I'm trying to keep it right next to a boulder. I'm gonna use a one ounce weight, cast it where it needs to. Work my rod up because I have a five foot leader between the hook and the bait, and letting that thing fall, and then bringing it up, letting it fall. So there is an application for those one ounce wow. weights out there. Oh yeah. And not only the current. Yes, if you're in, if you're fishing heavy current, Detroit River, St. Clair River, St. Lawrence River, places like that, a one ounce weight sometimes is what you really need. Yeah. Especially, and, and you want to keep. There's so much more to it. I mean, there's boat speed and keeping it around oh, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. certain. Greg DePalma and I, we, we, we went yep. over that big time last time. Sure. Yeah. So there's all that that goes into it. So uh, my weight selection is from 132nd to an ounce. Wow, 32nd. Wow. Yes. Well, we and we carry the full range here at uh, Susquehanna Fish and Tackle, but in a lot of cases, I always uh, inform people that once you start going into the three-quarter and one-ounce category, 
you're probably not going to want to be out on the water on the day you need those. Maybe. So you only need a couple. You only <laughs> yeah. need a couple packs uh, of those. Half five yeah. ace. So your your shallow water smallmouth fishing, say fifteen feet or less, whether it be an inland lake or even fish up shallow on the Great Lakes, I'm going to probably use a quarter and maybe a three ace here and there. Uh, for largemouth, typically a quarter if I'm working a you know eight to ten foot area where they're hanging out and I know that a finesse approach is, is what's needed. That's what I'm going to be using. I won't use a uh, pencil or cylinder. I'll, I'm going to use a round if I'm more than likely if I'm fishing for, for largemouth and I can't see them and I don't know what the bottom's like. I like the feel of a round. It's going to give you a little bit better feel for what's down there. And so if you come over a, a hard patch or whatnot, you'll be able to feel a little bit better with that with more, more, uh, contact. The, more contact on the there bottom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. The, the three... 32nd is going to be more of a, a suspended up drop shot approach when these fish are suspended and you mm. need that bait to just uh, just glide real Float. slow past them. Mm-hmm. So that's so I really do have all different sizes. That's impressive. Mm-hmm. I've never gone below an eighth in my so life. So sometimes that eighth will go way too fast. I've never gone below an so eighth. So I'm talking vertical. Uh, I don't want to give too much up. Yeah. Let's just straight, straight. Okay, up, straight, here. Straight up and down. You see this beam Fall right rate. here? You Fall see this rate. beam? Fall rate, right, yeah. Right? That fish is suspended by the uh, ugly stick thing yeah. you got mm-hmm. right there. Yeah, so mm-hmm. two, mm-hmm. three foot up off the And so the I need that drop shot, a uh, 330 second weight to yeah. just just go sure. right, right past. Sure. Right past. Sure. So and, and you'll have a little more of a buoyant bait yeah. on there to slow that down a little so bit. Yeah, you have a wacky rig, probably a so, three uh, inch thing. For, for all you guys watching surface area. So mm-hmm. for all you guys watching, when you're watching like uh Bassmaster Live or or some of these shows and those guys are staring at their their screen and they just flip the bail and just let it go right straight down. Oh, there's one. They just flip the bail and let it go straight down. That's what you're talking about. You're talking about vertical falling on a fish that you actually see. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it goes too fast past the fish, and he doesn't want to get, grab it. Sure. So yeah. he's going. Travis is going to mess with all the different weights until he gets that fall rate right. Mm-hmm. That that fish, when it comes down, he's going to have to take it because it's just too easy a prey. Yeah. So that, let's. That kind of. That's that kind exactly of right. Up? Yeah. Okay. So let's real quick. Let's just cover a couple different scenarios that you're going to encounter out there as far as deep water fish. So yeah. If I'm in twenty to forty feet of water, I'm going down the break line, or I, I identify an area where there's a big school of fish. Yeah. I have my drop shot ready to go. And I'm looking them on the graph. I have the bail opened. I got my I got my line in my left hand. Okay. <laughs> I don't believe that. And my rod right here. And I'm I'm looking. I'm scanning. And then when I see that fish, I'm either pitching or doing an overhand casting, to them. Yeah. And so the next step there is to watch how that fish reacts to the bait if you have the opportunity to. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times they're going to bite as soon as that bait falls in that area. Around they're going to yeah. come over and grab it, or they're going to sit there. And you got to dead stick that bait. I see so many times someone will throw that fish and they're like jigging it and I'll tell them 20 times a day, stop moving that rod. Let, let it, let Don't move that bait at all. Less is more. Yeah, I can't stress that enough. You have hmm. to just keep it right sitting down there and give it 20, 30 seconds if you know that fish is there and you're certain. Okay. And then reel up and keep trying. And 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 if and if no bites after two, three casts, then it's either a, it's or? either it's either a fish that is just in a, a a negative mood or wrong bait. Yeah, sometimes color you gotta, change. Sometimes you got to throw a. You know what? I love that. I love a, a any type of plastic imitating goby bait. Yeah. Okay. But when it when that fish doesn't want to suck that thing yeah. in, and I throw a a, a, a half shell or a three inch cinco. I'm gonna open up that can of gulp, three inch smelt, mm-hmm. and yeah. put it on there. Mm-hmm. Okay, if so that don't work, then yeah, maybe. You're but screwed. I'm thinking, Move I'm, on. but I'm thinking like you have maybe three to four drop shot rigs on your deck at all times. Yeah, well, is that right? I in a tournament setting for sure. Okay, but only because for break offs and time saving on time, I'll simply have in my pocket uh, okay. the plastics. You just. No, and then just changing them marinating out. in that gulp yeah. for a tournament day, I'll yeah. just grab them and then, okay. you know. All right. I mean, honestly, a lot of times when you get into a big school yep. and they're fishing deep and you just you grab whatever's on the bottom of the floor and hook it on and drop it. Yeah, down. oh, yeah, 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 you yeah. Know. We're I'm with you on fishing off the floor of the boat. Mm. Mike and I share boats, and what, we have, uh, we have oh, radically sure. different opinions on right? Tackle management. I'm sure. A, I like to have stuff organized. <laughs> right. Get right. to it. Mm-hmm. Mike likes to just kind of 
throw it all over the floor of the boat. <laughs> so as far as picking pa- plastics up, I've caught more fish fishing off the floor of the boat than I have out of the bag <laughs> sure. of boats in my life. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I get um, that. Yep. Hey, George, we got a, a fella here asking about Travis. What, uh, what For real snaggy cover on the bottom, what weight do you prefer? Uh, this one right here to the cylinder. The cylinder. So the cylinder style for real snaggy stuff and um, – the you know any other one you gotta the go barrel. light as possible if you're in in yeah. real real snaggy real go. snaggy stuff because you know like up to a thousand islands when you're talking snaggy you're talking but barnacles you know, zebras zebras yeah so, but yeah. I I listen and I don't want you to take that to heart because you're gonna encounter situations where you get in some snaggy stuff yeah and you want that drop shot hung up so yeah. you can pop it yes create the strike you know it's the same thing Mike when we're the fishing cra- on the it, river out yeah. here. And we hang a, a, a Ned rig or a tube up, and we teach our people how to pop the bait free. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As soon as you get your bait free, don't reel it in. Let's get ready. You're, 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 you're about to catch a fish. That's my point. You're always around you're fish. You don't have to run to another area. Right. You Think know, about it. How many times does that happen? Yeah. And I've said this a yeah. million times. But back in the old days on the In Fisherman TV show, they used to talk about swimming down underwater and banging rocks together. Yeah. And the smallmouth would swim over to see what the sound mm-hmm. was. And our good friend J.C. Nuss from yeah. Lakeside Marine, yeah. back when he was guiding hardcore, you know, every day of the week for months scuba on I, end. Scuba, scuba. He went snorkeling. He had his family out on 4th of July weekend. He was anchored up on the river. Yep. And he swam down the rope. Yep. Got to the bottom of his anchor. He picked up two rocks. Yep. All right. And a bunch of smallies swam over to see I'll give you guys That's something. Crazy. I'm going to give you guys a... Uh, not the full story, but a, a hint. Let's give a hint away. Let's, There's another reason, and you just, no wait, based no wait. on your story. There you go. <laughs> There's another reason why sometimes a tag in is beneficial. Can you put the puzzle together? Slows down the fall of the weight. Nope. Bro, I, We're I've, talking about banging in noise. I've been there. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, why do you think I'll leave the tag in hanging out there? Lasso, there lasso in a uh, Well, no, what you can do is, uh, you know, there's a different there's different um, weights and beads and things like that. And you Put can two add weights on. a little sound to that yeah. that drop shot. Instead uh, of going with an eighth, go with two sixteenths. Ah, so you're holding back on me, Big Jake. Clickety-clack. Clickety-clack, <laughs> not telling me all about this stuff. All right, well. And guess what happens? Look at that. So That where, old spawn is over How to would look? you do that? But, uh, well, there. you can put two on, or listen, almost think of a, a Carolina rig, right? Where you have oh, a yeah. swivel and you have a bead and you have a, yeah. maybe a little cylinder, uh, I call it like a washer. There you go. Yeah, a uh, uh, top brass tackle. Mm-hmm. This knocker. Carolina right. ticker. Oh, Carolina ticker. Carolina ticker. Yeah. So. So you put that. Thanks for bringing that up, by the way, Travis, because mm-hmm. Mike and I, when we go up to fish the river. I, I literally I, he don't tell me I rent stuff, my own man. house so I can rig my rods up in private. <laughs> He's always doing this. And uh now There you go. And that's exactly what it sounds like underwater. It's a smallmouth Geiger counter. Uh bastard. Speed, sound travels six times more efficiently underwater than it does through air. Mm-hmm. So the purpose of that is these. So these gobies that are down there that these fish are feeding on, there's there's thousands of them, and they're smart and they don't wander too far from their little crack house that they have. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you know, just look at your floor here. We have little cracks. They're in their little deal. Yeah. And so anytime you can cause some disturbance, where and that's where yeah. they're up on top of it. Well, Travis, we have. Uh... Dan McDonald stopping in and saying hi. Uh, Lynn, Lynn, uh, uh, Lynn, Lynn stopping in and saying hi. And then we have uh, Joseph Zombeck. Mm. You know Joe. I know Joe. I know Joe. Yeah. John everybody, Henning. Everybody knows you know Joe. Joe. Joe's, kind of a, Joe's kind of a hammer up on the, on the big water. Jeff Riddle yeah. Riddle's still yeah, hanging tight with us. And Brian Moffitt's here. Uh, who else have we got? Uh, uh, Sean... Pang, Sean, yeah, yeah, we know Sean. Sean. We know Sean, and uh, okay, so um, 
The crack house crack just house. got busted. <laughs> <laughs> so, Antonio, go, 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 Mez. How you doing, bro? Go, go. And uh, appreciate everybody stopping by. Man, I tell you, it's so it's always uh, it's always awesome to have all of our our uh, customers and friends stopping into our show. We really appreciate it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, as always, you learn something. I mean, this is some crazy stuff you guys are learning tonight. Uh, it was our highest uh, view tonight. So, I mean, you guys really sucked in some great information so far. And, um, you know, Travis, thanks, man. I really yeah. appreciate all that. Anything else you got? What, what, do you, what else you got that's like? Well, I mean, that's, so, that's so we talked about. So we what talked, do you got going well, on? Well, I just want to finish some of the main patterns. So we yeah. talked about the deep water pattern. There's yep. always going to be a shallow water pattern. Yep. And I will throw a drop shot when I'm sight fishing for cruisers up shallow, yep. too. A lot of times I'm using a reaction bait first to find those fish. Yeah. And then I'm having that drop shot ready to go in case I get a follow. Right. Uh, same deal. I'm going to use three inch Senko, something like that. Even yep. a Gobi style bait will work in those situations. Um, but I'm trying to cram in as much as I can here. As, no, I know, know that. And, and, we, and, we, and we also had some other finesse techniques. You know, we, you're known for drop shot, but you know, you've got other finesse techniques that you do. Yes. Yeah, so, so what do you like, you know, when, when a drop shot just is like, not the not the gig, but you still want to super finesse. What do you, what do you do? Uh, I mean, I think the drop shot's always the gig, but it's just showing them a different presentation. And sometimes yeah. you just feel like doing something different. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so when that's the triggering case, a, triggering another fish or sure. something. Sure. Yeah. If that's the case, you know, I've been experimenting a lot with with real small uh, finesse plastics and baits like that. Yeah. Uh, smaller than what you know most people would even throw. You know, the Ned Rig obviously has become really popular. There's so many different uh, companies out there that make them. Yeah. Uh, when you're fishing pressured water, my, my best advice to give you is to uh, stay away from that Ned. If you feel like it's being overfished or maybe you ran out of fish or things, just give them a different look. And what I've been experimenting with is, you know, Z-Man makes a lot of unique, smaller, soft plastics, and they're calling them now, like a TRD Bugs and things like that. Start yep. throwing these on a Ned Rig and fishing it just like you would a Ned. Sure. And I think you're going to increase your, your bite. Even these tubes, man, are killer. Yeah. Um, the ticklers. Or the ticklers and these tubes. And they fish completely different, mm -hmm. the ticklers yep. and the tubes. And the other one that we do really well with is the TRD Hogs. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big bait of Corbin's, uh, especially in cold, dirty water. Sure. Yeah. We just did a video, video about... Uh, Nico, Nico, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. rigging these baits. Oh, really? <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. And really? So, oh, yeah. Now, when you Nico yeah. rig That's a awesome. Z-Man bait, Mike, yeah. are you aware that you need to use the Z-Man Nico helps. weight? helps. Yeah. Because it will oh, yeah. go into the bait. No, that's why they came and out. That's why they came stay out in the that. bait. But Nico rigging... A tickler Z, yes, is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a similar look, but it's not. Okay, yeah. so you're dragging it with a with a lead weight. There, it's coming across right. a little bit different. Yeah, although it is still buoyant, it's just a different presentation. Wow, uh, it it does. It's very efficient. So how how uh, pressure? Let's talk pressure, mm -hmm. man. How pressured do you think these fish can handle? And the fishing still being uh, good on places like, and if it affected on places like the Chesapeake Bay, which you know well, and the Thousand Islands, Lake Ontario. So, how do you how do you feel that the pressure affected that up there? Well, I don't and, think and, and uh, there. there's no pressure on the on the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River compared to the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, Chesapeake's so, unreal. Uh, I don't let that bother me at all. Right. I know a lot of guys that fish up in that zone might say or are concerned mm -hmm. but i'm not concerned you about fished it. um the ike tournament this year yes yeah. and and it was in june so mm -hmm. they got beat up for a long period of time yeah they did and you saw what happened in that tournament yes so uh that's what i say i say there's pressured fish and then there's pressured fish that you can catch but keep in mind the winners of that event fished where all the pressured fish were yeah right there for that whole week so yeah. i guide out there every day and leading up to that event starting the week prior it was deteriorating every day for yeah. me uh they yeah. did turn on that they, the day of the tournament for an hour <laughs> i made a i made a, a judgment call just based on experience and that was to run as far away as i could mm -hmm. and that's what i did and yeah. came back with zero and um well, at, at noon, I didn't have a fish. But that's 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 what I was saying. I'm I'm kind of like, um, even though like all the pressure that happens on these bodies of water, there's always 
There's always fish you can catch. There's always fish you can catch. It's just yeah. not, not might not be enjoyable or fun or what you want to, yeah. what your thoughts are right. of the day. It can right. it it's going to drain on you mentally and it'll emotionally just kill you if you're stuck sitting there on the Chesapeake we, Bay all the time. Yeah, we have a lot of cu- <laughs> we have a yeah, right. through that. Like, <laughs> we have a lot of customers that are it takes a special person to live in this area to drive down 95 <laughs> in the traffic and want to go catch maybe get six bites a day. That's yeah. a special fish. That is a special fish. <laughs> But three of them might be six pounders, right? Right. We have we, we we have a lot of new customers that are that are starting to turn them fish down there, mm-hmm. that you know, uh, literally just started last year, you know, with some of the some of the local events. You know, you, you, you fish them, but uh, that's a that's the point that we like to make is even though everybody says, oh, that that water's pressured to death, and you got to fish against all the locals, uh, you know, the the fish can be caught always. Mm-hmm. You just gotta. You know, and, and if you and if you look at, if you, if you just listen, what these guys are doing. I mean, these guys are Nico rigging a tickler Z to catch fish. So there's, you know, open your eyes, open your mind, and listen to what these guys are saying because Travis is cutting edge, man. He's always, he's him and him and and Eric. I mean, you guys are like. Always, always coming up with weird stuff. Mm-hmm. Always doing, always breaking yeah. the barrier. I think Eric and I make a good team uh, when, when we do our lives and we talk about different tackle because he's the tackle nut. Yeah. Where I'm more of uh, just the thought process and just keeping things simple for yeah. me. Yeah. Is how I approach things. Where he likes to make sure that if he buys this bait out of the pack, he's gonna, yeah, you know, make sure that. <laughs> Everything's I don't know right. what he's going to do. Yeah. Take a piece of sandpaper and <laughs> sand this part right here down real quick. Yeah. Well, you Eric, know. Eric, when he first comes. First, he's going to look through 24 of them. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Every time Eric comes here, he pulls the pegs off and he asks, hey, do you got any more in the back that we can look at? <laughs> I absolutely, <laughs> and, and absolutely he, respect his, absolutely. his tackle acumen. Yeah, that's all good mm-hmm. stuff. But, you know, so for everybody out there who are is new to it or uh, even hardcore guys, I mean, I'm hardcore. And I don't think like these guys do. So there's another level of thinking out there that you can do to catch fish that are pressured, catch fish that are that, that have been hammered on for weeks on end, and um, and 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 to go out and catch these fish in all these different areas. Well, there's another way of looking at it too. Uh, a vast majority of the time that people are fishing in certain areas, you know, popular areas. Off, not not off the beaten path, but more main main areas. The majority of the time that there is people present fishing there, there is no fish there. In tidal water, fish move up into a feeding area for a very brief window, and then yeah. they move out. Well, the only time that's different is pre-spawn through the spawn when they move up. Yeah, not to feed. Yeah. But to spawn, and they're there for a period of time to fan beds, yeah. lay eggs, females back off, and then protect those beds. Yeah. And those fish will be there for – and then there's, there's, there's wave after wave after wave that reuse the same beds. So mm-hmm. that, that time of the year, there'll be a, quite a few fish in one area repeatedly. But when you go into some of the more heavily – and I don't care where you go. If you think the upper Chesapeake Bay gets a lot of pressure, mm-hmm. my friends – let me tell you about a place called Lake Gunnersville. You want to talk about pressure? They got more tournaments Monday through Friday than we've ever seen Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every yeah. day. And they, still, and they still catch them and hammer them. So it's, yeah. uh, hey, Texas uh, rig, uh, well, we were just talking about um, uh, one of the tournaments that was, that was, that we did. I know Travis and I fished it, um, the Ike tournament uh, down there. And John Henning chimed in and said it was a it was a good tournament or not john henning i'm sorry uh uh not john henning uh where was he here tom tom knee well he would say it was a good tournament oh, yeah. tom knee chimed in mm-hmm. and he said oh that was a good tournament <laughs> he would tend to say that he's that guy you were talking about yeah. that was sitting there yeah and then like he said you know uh they just turned on but they turned on but uh it just goes to show that you know yeah so that's cool Watch yourself. I am. Tom, thanks for chiming in. <laughs> thank, thank, thanks for chiming in, Tom. That was a, a fantastic deal for you. That was awesome. He was fishing with his boy, son, John. John, yeah. 
There's dad, dad, John. Dad, yeah. Dad, yeah, dad, John. I got that reversed. But, you know, that was impressive. And, you know, if you look back and read about their, their win in that tournament, you know, kind of takes us off point a little bit, but that is tidewater fishing in a nutshell. On that particular day, as Travis had said, they bit for an hour. What Travis meant by that was the bite window at that time of the year, due to the fishing pressure and due to, you know, the weather conditions and the, all the other factors that affect these the eight little eight million things fish, that need the stars need to line up. And you know, everything. there was a one-hour bite window. Corbin was there. On whatever. I don't, and I wasn't there, so I don't know what the tide was doing at that time, but I have a feeling it was probably early incoming. Corbin whacked it. No, and end of the day. End of the day. That doesn't mean it wasn't early incoming. Was that what it was? It was incoming. It early, was early incoming. Early incoming. Yeah, Corbin was there, and Corbin caught all of his fish after weigh-in. Hmm. He whacked them after yeah, weigh-in. Yeah. We, we chose not to uh, weigh in. That, that <laughs> well, I don't think you chose not to weigh <laughs> well, in. You didn't have anything to weigh in. Well, we ch- well, <laughs> no, well, I've been we, there. We, I, I, we, we, we had a couple. I mean, <laughs> I listen. put them in a bag and saw 13 pounds in a scale and no, said, yeah, I know let's it. just go. I mean, I, when, I, when you're pulling up to the dock and a guy says, if you don't have 20, don't even weigh him in. And right. we're sitting with 19 something thinking we're going to do something. No, mm-hmm. that ain't going to happen. I was just afraid Freddie was going to yell at me for uh, trying to load a jet boat in Northeast again like he did the first time I was oh, down yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, yeah. we got some other stuff going on, George. Real quick. Yeah, so uh, we need to, like, kind of wrap up the old drop shot conversation yeah. here. Put a bow on it. Travis... Uh, Recap covered some rod mm-hmm. actions. He felt the seven foot medium light and the seven foot medium covered ninety nine percent of his fishing. Which needs. was which is which is kind of what a lot of people think that you know you have to go super light on a rod. Well, there's a second guy because Greg De Palma is a medium heavy guy for a drop shot. Yeah, Greg likes Very a heavier good. rod for drop. A little different, a little different, uh, but that's bigger what hook he does with yeah, bigger hook. Um, you know, Travis talked about his reel. Size the three thousand size. He talked about his line, um, which he's blew a, me he's, away. He's much lighter than most of us. He's a five awesome. pound. I love that on his medium light. Love it. An eight pound on his medium. I love it. Talked about his leader weights will vary from six to twelve. Leader lengths will vary from five to twelve, fifteen. Uh, we talked about baits, hooks. Um, weights. The hooks were, were a little smaller than what Mike and I and Corbin are used to, but we learned some valuable information there. That was cool. Talked about the, the shape of that, the weight. Travis. The shape of the weight. Yeah. The weight. Yeah. I mean, drop shotting has been dissected. We talked about colors. We got it. Bait shapes. We got it. Bait sizes. We got it. Hooks relating to baits. I mean, yeah. Travis. It's awesome. Dude, you knocked it out of the park. There you Kill go. It, Killer. Travis, spectacular, beautiful job. Well, thank you. Beautiful job, Travis. Beautiful thank job. You. Well, I'll tell you right now, we got something we want to say. We do. We got a uh, special announcement here. Yeah, we're gonna kind of jump. We want to just jump in on this real quick. Yeah. What do you got, George? Uh the man, the myth, the legend. A very good friend of SFT Tackle and SFTTackle.com had a birthday last week. Mr. David Fritz. Whoa, happy birthday, Uncle David Happy Davis. birthday, David Fritz. Yeah, man. You're awesome, bro. Good As always. Of, good friend of the show. 42 what, never looks what, so good. I was going to say 40, 42. I mean, yep. he looks great. Yep. He, and right. he was out in Texas hunting, so he yeah. hunt for his birthday. And uh, for his birthday, he what, gave what, us what did all. We, what did we give him? Two new sizes of the number five Fritz side, <laughs> which we... Had as an in the pipeline bait last week. Yep. We are now, we have taken some large deliveries. We are in stock on SFTTackle.com. The Fritz Side 5 Junior, which is a quarter ounce model, going to run about two to five feet, silent. Yeah. And the Biggin, the number five Biggin, which completes the five family, um, is a. Three seventh of an ounce, I don't know, half ounce, uh, under half ounce, three sevenths, yeah, under slightly, yeah. slightly Fritz. under, and Call also right runs between two and five feet. We should. But obviously has a bigger. So now you have the junior, 
the standard, and the biggin' in the size 5. And as we've talked numerous times, the Fritz side is legit. Legit. You, you so, haven't finished that yet, Travis. Not yet. Nope. Mr. David Fritz. That's a real deal, dude. We want to wish you a happy birthday. Them. And we yeah. want to appreciate all them, all these nice gifts you've been giving us, even yes. though it's your birthday. Happy birthday, David. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure. George, do they make those in, like, the medium divers or just the five-foot one? No, there's a five, a seven, and a nine. However, the junior and the big one only come in the five. Okay, that's what I was curious about. I didn't know so, if there was, like, a middle big one. It's, it's kind of like a DT, Rapala DT. The five runs to five feet. The seven runs to seven feet. And the nine runs to nine feet on a long cast with a 10-pound line. So you're going to have some variation there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the five being the most popular size for this year, they added up junior. What rod are you cranking with, Travis? So, okay. Hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's a whole... Well, just, How much time you got? Okay, no, I mean, no, no. Glass uh, or graphite? Glass or graphite? I use graphite. Or, I'm sorry, I use glass. You use glass. I use glass yeah. and... I recently got my hands on the new, well, new to me, the St. Croix. Uh, Tournament? The brownish yeah. colored one, orangish yeah. brown. Yeah, dark, fantastic. Yeah. Wow, blown away by it. Fantastic. 7.2 medium moderate, I guess? Yes. Yes. But I'm looking now for something that's going to be in that same lineup, but for like a DT6, something in that so range So the 7.2 medium moderate is going to be your DT6 rod. Oh. When you go to the 7.4 medium heavy moderate. All right, that's the one it is that I had. Okay. Like a DT10, I'm thinking. Or, the seven or, four. Oh, you have the 7.4 medium heavy moderate. Yes. Yeah, so back yourself okay. down to the 7.2 medium moderate. Yeah. Or if you want a roll cast rod, the 6.10 medium moderate, and that's going to cover all your square bills, your frit sides, your DT6s, mm-hmm. um, so yeah. on and so forth. That 7.4 medium heavy moderate is going to throw all the ways up to an 8XD. It, I will say this. They also sent me a... Mojo glass rod. Beautiful. And that's glass, same man. glass, by the way. I was blown away it by is. that. Same glass. And the price, you, you saw the price. Yes. It's the same glass. Same glass. Uh, does not have IPC uh, tooling. Made but, me- and it's made in Mexico. I think it's made in Mexico made in other than. Other Francilla, than Mexico. Yeah. But here's the cool thing uh, you can't tell the difference Mm-mm. until you look at your credit card statement. Sure. Then you can tell the difference. The other thing I want to add about that series of rods that Travis brought up, uh, which I've been Mike and I have been fishing for about two years yeah. now. We fished or, or the six more. ten. Yeah, we we fished it. the six ten medium moderate, seven, the two. seven two medium. Yeah. They have just brought out for all you glass chatter wagon fans. Yeah. They have brought out a seven four, four heavy. heavy heavy moderate. You can get it in the mojo. It was that in the mojo. That's probably the one they the sent me because. I That's said to myself, I said to myself, this rod is going to be an ideal chatterbait rod. Yeah. So, so anyone that, that heavy moderate. So, I, I want to clarify a few things. Anyone that follows uh, my YouTube channel, what we talk about on there, you've known that I've used Dobbin bait casters for years, yeah. and they have glass rods, seven hundred four, yeah. seven hundred five, seven sixty five. They also have that uh, uh, chatterbait rod that's a fiberglass that I really like, and I'm just. Looking right now, and I'm looking hard at the St. Croix lineup, and that's why I'm really looking hard at those crankbait rods right now because yeah, that's I'm seven thinking f- about making a switch here pretty soon. That's 7.4 heavy moderate in the Legend Tournament glass, which is what you're looking at, mm-hmm. and the Mojo, which mm-hmm. you mentioned. That is an exceptional chatter wagon rod. Um, it'll handle big line, big fish. Uh, if you prefer that style of rod, mm-hmm. you know, there's – the chat. We're gonna do a whole chatterbait show coming up. Coming up. We're yeah. not sure when because we just keep getting all these awesome guests dropping in. But yeah. we're gonna do a chatterbait show in the very near future, and we're going to it's gonna be everything. It's gonna be rods and reels all the way up through, just like we did with the drop shot today. We're gonna talk about the glass versus the. Graphite, the graphite and the composites, yeah, and the different tapers and all that good stuff, and. You know, what's interesting, Travis, um, you know, I know you're a big St. Croix spinning rod guy, and their their glass, their mojo, and their legend uh, glass is spectacular. Mm-hmm. I mean, spectacular. I've it thrown is. it. I've thrown it. Mike's thrown it. We've thrown it for. How many years, George? 
out hundreds of hours. They used to make a they used to make a rod called the Pro Glass. Pro Glass, which was also S Glass, yeah. which has evolved into it, these rods. Yeah, it, and and that was mm-hmm. year that was fifteen years ago, bro. And then they stopped making it, and then they evolved into this, and they started to really get yeah. so, specific I mean, on legit. the actions it's and very, everything. It's very, yeah. very, very, yeah, legit. very, very good stuff. Um, Saint Croix has very few holes <sighs> in their freshwater lineup. Very yeah. few holes. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's going to yeah. be interesting to see down the road, say, next fall, next late summer, yeah. fall, when you get back from the North Country, we might have you back yeah. in again. And be very interesting to see if you went down that path, you know, after you've had a chance to catch a boatload of fish it, on that yeah. rod, mm-hmm. what yeah. you think. Yeah. You know, because yeah. really, you, I, I don't care whose rod you fish or if somebody sends you a rod to try out. And you like shaking around, awesome, awesome. You don't know anything about that rod until you're fishing in the wind. Yep. Mm-hmm. Not the wind. Deep, not the deep. Current, not the current. Until you do all that, you really can't evaluate that rod. Right. So, and I, which I know, you know, with your time on the water, that's that's going to happen. And I and I'm pretty we, we, sure we I know. Like where to, you're, we would like to have a review. Pretty on sure that. I know where you're going to end up with that. Maybe you could, maybe we could do a call in on one of our deals, and you can. Review that with us. You know what? It, making this switch uh, is exciting, but at the same time, it's a, it's a lot of work because you don't have – I don't have experience with all their lineups. Yeah. I'm familiar with them. Yeah. So I really have to uh, – You need to delve into it. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm really happy to see the selection of St. Croix rods you have here. So expect me back bro. in the next two to three weeks, yeah. and I'd like to just take – Take an hour of, of my time here just playing with these rods, if you don't mind. No, no, and, no. And maybe take... <laughs>